<laughs> uh, I know, Charlie. I wish I could amend that to myself sometimes, yeah. but uh, we wouldn't say anything about Bob now, would we? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> the format of the college is in three parts. First, we have our infamous announcement period. Then our speaker speaks. Then we have the Q and A session, and then we follow up with our infamous. Rebuttal period, where you get to speak about anything under the sun, even perhaps the speaker was speaking about tonight. And at 11 o'clock, we are out of here. So, to paraphrase Brown, without further ado, let's get the messages and announcements moving. Come on up front so we can get you fully. The microphone is broken because it was dropped last week, so you'll have to speak loudly and clearly like true soapboxers should. So, you have a loud voice so we can pick you up. All right, without any further ado, we will hear from our speaker, Bob Matter. All right. <laughs> My uh, boss just got back from Vietnam, actually, uh, and uh, from vacation, and brought this brought it back for me, uh, and a couple other gift items, and uh, he had himself some uh, nice suits made over there, and nice shirts and some nice ties. We have a suit made over there for uh, eighty dollars. They look really, really, really nice. The shirts are, but not, not much. There's no amplification, so please speak up loud. Um, I started uh, thinking about this speech uh, oh, back a few months ago as a result of uh, being on Facebook. I saw a comment somebody had made. It was probably a threat about the Iraq War or Afghanistan, and then somebody made a reference to Vietnam, and I, I thought it looked fishy. And I, I did a little quick research and found out that it was, in fact, a fishy or a, a falsehood. And I posted something about it, and then it kind of started a little minor shitstorm on there, and then all those people were debating. And I thought, well, you know what? I think this would be a good speech topic to uh, confront a lot of these things that we've taken for uh, conventional wisdom that we've heard repeated so many times, and we just think they're, they're true just because you've, you've heard them so often. And the source is usually uh, communist propaganda or liberal uh, liberals, you know, liberal media or oh, yeah. liberals, like guys like Red Charlie, uh, you know, spouting this stuff. And uh, being uh, somewhat of a skeptic, I thought, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, examine some of these uh, kind of you know, myths and falsehoods, and you know, get to the truth of the matter and see if they're you know, true or not. And uh, some of the things I, I heard, as a matter of fact, I, I grew up during the Vietnam War. I was too young to go. I graduated from high school in 75. But uh, I knew, uh, had, you know, friends who had, uh, you know, brothers who were in the war. 33 at the time? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. And they quit the draft in 72, by the way. But anyway, uh, and I, uh, I lived with a Vietnam vet for three years. I had a roommate. We shared a house together. And of course, I went to college with a new number of uh, Vietnam vets who, uh, probably because of the, uh, probably because of the recession of '73, decided to take advantage of the uh, GI Bill benefits and go back to school. So, uh, so I met a number of uh, Vietnam vets in school. And of course, I worked with them uh, in jobs I had, and uh, and still continue to this day. I mean, I've been at, been a volunteer at Facets for uh, 11 years. This is about as loud as I can go, so you just have to be quiet and listen hard. Uh, so I've been at Facets for about 11 years, and uh, 
a guy that I'm pretty friendly with there, a projectionist, uh, Ron DeGraff, who's a Vietnam vet. He was a medic at uh, Tui La Air Base, which is kind of on the southern coast. Vietnam is kind of S-shaped. That part that sticks out down there in the bottom, that's Tui Wa's right on that coast. Uh, so he, he was there in 1970. Um, so anyway, so it's always been, uh, you know, I've always been around veterans, and of course, you know, hearing the media, I was, you know, kind of always a news junkie as a kid. And, uh, saw the news, you know, daily on tape, television, uh, the newspapers about Vietnam. So it's always something that's been around. And one of the one of the uh, things I used to hear all the time, and you still hear it, I've heard it repeated here a number of times, was that the Vietnam War was waged for war profiteering by U.S. defense contractors. You hear that all the time. It was for the money. It was good for the money. And you know, I've also heard that. The war was waged to exterminate black, brown, and poor people. It was a form of our genocide, right? Over, over here, to get rid of the get rid of the poor blacks and browns and poor whites. Uh, then also, you know, something else you hear all the time is we did it because Vietnam was a major rubber producer, and we wanted, to, you know, to uh, take advantage of, of uh, their rubber plantations and other natural resources, which is uh, imperialism. Uh, or how about this one? War was waged for, for control of the oil shipping lanes. That was one I used to hear a lot. And war was waged for control of uh, offshore drilling in the South China Sea. That was another one I heard. And uh, probably the most egregious spreader of falsehoods I found, I traced this back, uh, this, this particular falsehood actually, uh, amongst many, uh, was from the same guy. War was waged to, to test new Pentagon weapons. Anybody know who said that? Riverside, New York, 1967. Martin Luther King. He gave a speech to something called the, the Coalition and Laity or something against the Vietnam War or something like that. And you can download that. It's a podcast on iTunes. You can download it for free. Just go over to iTunes, do a search for Vietnam. And a bunch of things will come up with Vietnam and them, games and books and albums or you know records and then they'll have one thing's podcast and scroll through the podcasts and you'll see something called uh, something like great speeches in history or something like that. So what was the reason? That he what was the reason that he spoke? Well, well, that, that he he has a whole bunch of them in, in that speech, but he says that war was waged to test new Pentagon weapons. Uh, just and he compared us to Nazi Germany, just like the Germans were experimenting with, uh, uh, you know, the uh, their prisoners, uh, you know, and the people in the concentration camps experimenting, you, you know, on uh, you know new medical techniques and things like that. So, and anyway, he had, a, he had quite a few. I noticed uh, probably five or ten other uh, <coughs> myths and falsehoods I've heard over the years. I heard come directly out of that speech by Martin Luther King. So. Uh, that's where I see a lot of that comes from now. Uh, some other ones. I guess some of these on paper, some on the computer. Uh, most American soldiers were addicted to drugs. And, uh, you know, and that's, 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 that's not true. There are no more addicted drugs than, than anybody else, uh, you know, in their age group uh, from their population. Um, another myth, most Viet everybody thinks most Vietnam uh, veterans were drafted. In fact, only two-thirds of the of men who served in Vietnam, uh, two-thirds of the men who served in Vietnam were volunteers, that's what uh, Two-thirds of the men who served in World War II were drafted. But in Vietnam, only, two, only a third were, were uh, drafted. Uh, and 70% of those killed were volunteers. Now, how could that be? Well, that's because they tended to be pilots. And, uh, Ron, you're gonna, I'm getting the shadow mumbling from you over here. It's disturbing me. Can you stuff a sack in it? Shadow mumbling? Yeah. So, <laughs> okay, so, 
Um, <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, you know they tended to be um, they tended to be officers, uh, and you know and they tended to be things like you know pilots. So those guys, the lead officers in the uh, in the combat units, had a pretty high mortality rate. Um, here's, here's a popular one. Uh, suicides among Vietnam veterans, you know, are you know higher than uh, you know uh, you know the normal things like that. that the, and in fact, uh, only uh, the suicide rate was slightly elevated, but only for the first five years after they returned. And after that, they pretty much returned uh, to normal. Uh, now, get, getting. Uh, Kind of related to that, I guess we'll go ahead and mention it. You know, we hear about you know post-traumatic stress syndrome. You know, the guy gets a lot of airplay. Yeah, I guess you, know, you want to think that the, the, a lot of them have it, or all of them, or a majority. But in fact, uh, fewer Vietnam vets, as a percentage of uh, uh, you know, like per thousand, you know, they have they have less uh, post-traumatic stress disorder than World War II vets. And I believe even Korean vets uh, as well. Uh, I believe the figures I read in the uh, it was actually highest among World War II vets. Of course, they back then they called it they didn't call it post traumatic stress disorder. They called it shell shock. Uh, I would say that there is some there are no doubt are some serious uh, psychological issues. With Vietnam vets, though, that, that the World War II guys didn't have, and the Korean guys, uh, you know, they, they did go through some there were some malicious firefights, prolonged ones. And the thing about Vietnam vets compared to other vets is that they saw the ones that were in combat saw a lot more combat days in a year than the other guys did. Something like 240 days a year versus about 40 days in four years or 10 days a year. For a World War II vet, and that was because of the fact of the of the helicopter. The helicopter, you know, chopper you right into these hot zones uh, really quickly, and uh, you know, so that's accounted for a lot more of the the, uh, the, the days of fighting scene. And uh, so I, I got to say that's got to have an effect on people. And uh, matter of fact, even. Uh, you know, see the uh, the Iraqi veterans now have quite a uh, uh, bout of uh, post traumatic stress disorder as well because of uh, the fact that they it was the stop loss thing that they were held over for you know two or three uh, tours and sometimes it's some very very thick fallacious uh, uh, fighting so you know there's no doubt that some some of that exists but uh, uh, and some of it very severe, but overall, it's not like you know majority of them have it, or that even quite a few. It's uh, it's not as big and widespread as you, the media would have you believe. Uh, and related to something I mentioned earlier, uh, one of my own theories, and then I see uh, the myth. Uh, one of the myths is that a disproportionate number of blacks were killed in the Vietnam War. As a matter of fact, Martin Luther King said this in his speech as well, the Riverside speech 1967. Happened to be on April 4th, by the way, 1967, exactly one year from when he was assassinated. 86% uh, of the men who died in Vietnam were Caucasians, 12.5% were black, which is about, you know, roughly proportional to their uh, population in the United States in general, and 1.2% were, were other races. Uh, I, I looked into some uh, demographics, you know, other places, and it the, uh, seemed like the, uh, you know, if you wanted to predict uh, uh, who was going to be killed in Vietnam, it was basically going to be a, a white cat. And uh, the least likely to die in Vietnam would be a white Jew. And that's because they tended, of course, to have uh, generally be higher up on the socioeconomic ladder and could afford to go to college and uh, get a deferment. So there weren't too many uh, too many white Jews in, uh, in, in the 
Army or the military. Um, and again, we hear this thing, that, this myth that the war was fought largely by the poor and the uneducated. Uh, I haven't really addressed the, the poor a lot, but uh, as far as uneducated, uh, Vietnam veterans were the best educated forces we ever had. 79% uh, of them had a high school education or better. You often hear that uh, you know the average age of a of a soldier in Vietnam was 19. I've heard that many times. I'm sure you have. And in fact, the average age. Was actually 22. I just want to make sure that I got it right. Uh, the other one they came out. Let's say with their 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 year of service, they were 22. Um, the average uh, age uh, fighting in World War II was 26 years of age. I don't I don't know what uh, what the average was in Korea, although. Korea is probably my weak, one of my weak points in uh, in history that I plan to do something about and uh, read more about. And I had actually an uncle uh, who, uh, actually two uncles uh, that were in the Korean War. One was uh, a Marine, 1st Marine Division, a machine gunner, and uh, one, he was in Korea, and one was uh, in the Air Force uh, Station in Alaska. Both, uh, both came out alive. Um, but anyway, I have picked up a couple of books on Korea, and I do want to read more about Korea because uh, Korea has some interesting statistics, and some of it's related with this, and hopefully I'll remember to talk about it uh, later. Um, now, we've all heard about the domino theory and the common, uh, the uh, uh, you know, kind of much touted rhetoric we used to hear all talking about domino theory, which was partially true, but one of the myths was that the domino theory was false. And actually, uh, although the domino theory was proved false, and uh, actually that is not true. Um, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand stayed free of communism. It is my opinion and others that this was as a direct result of our commitment to Vietnam. See in a little bit, you know why that is so. Vietnam was a proxy war, basically between us and the Soviet Union, just a a chapter in the Cold War, and uh, because of the fact that we won the Cold War. You know, democracies tend to, are, are flourishing right now, pretty much. 179 of the 192 countries in the world of sovereign states are now electing their legislators. <laughs> and uh, so for the big picture, and we'll see in a little bit why, you know, why Vietnam was important in shaping that big picture. Um, things that I think is uh, unfortunately untrue is that there still exists uh, you know, hundreds of missing in action being held by the Vietnamese or the Lao Laotians or the Cambodians uh, as bargaining chips or something like that. Uh, I forget the exact number of MIA missing in actions that were out there. Maybe it was 600 or something like that. But unfortunately, 
Where do you get your statistics oh, from? What, what, well, yeah, there'll me. be a question Which period later on. Yeah, he just said to me. Um, I'll make a book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Talk to us more about why we're the, the thing about the missing in actions, you know what? If there were any, if there were any alive, I don't think the communists would hesitate to have murdered them after, you know, sometime after the war, um, because they wouldn't want to look bad by, you know, they would, certainly wouldn't want to be disgraced by having held them after they said they did. So, more than likely, if they were being held at all. They were murdered. Uh, if they were captured before they got to me, probably before they got to where they were going, they might have been killed on the way there. Probably, but I've heard from, uh, I've read from uh, uh, some eyewitness reports of uh, missionaries that, that, that saw some of this. Uh, a lot of times, you know, once once you got captured after a brief period of torture, you, you'd just be executed right there. I mean, they, they wouldn't keep you around. Uh, so, unfortunately, I'm afraid that, you know, I see all these flags all the time with the silhouette, you know, of the, of the missing in action and all that, and I'm afraid there's just probably, that's, that's probably just a myth. I don't think there's any, any Americans alive over there. Uh, if they weren't murdered by the Vietnamese or the Laotians or Cambodians, then uh, they would probably have died uh, uh, by them, just in the horrible conditions there, uh, in the jungles, especially in the, in the, the middle highlands there. Uh, they would have died of exposure or starvation. Uh, you know, it's very, uh, it's very thick, intense uh, jungle, and snakes, poisonous snakes, and all kinds of uh, things. And uh, so, it's, I think it's pretty doubtful that there's there's any. Uh, Missing in action, still alive, or being held. Um, let me think of a few other. There was a there was a few in the book. My principal source of this uh, speech is uh, Vietnam, the Necessary War by Michael Lind, L-I-N-D. And uh, he highlights uh, a number of uh, other, uh, other myths that have uh, come through the years. Um, there were myths that, uh, you know, we could have reached a uh, uh, coalition government, you know, solution. You know, that's that's something communists always try to do. They tried to do this in China. They said they were going to do it in Korea. They said they were going to do it in Vietnam. You know, when Vietnam fell, they, of course, they uh, went to Laos and Cambodia immediately fell afterwards. Uh, Thank you. You know, they never have a coalition government. That's just something they say to appease the West. And I, I think, uh, I believe the quote is actually uh, uh, footnoted in here uh, from, one of, from one of the leaders. Uh, actually, you know, admitted it. You know, that's something we just do to uh, to appease the West. So, the point is uh, you know, the main the main point of why we were there. If it wasn't for oil. It wasn't for the rubber. Um, you know, it wasn't for oil drilling or shipping or anything like that. Uh, but the the chief purpose was to demonstrate America's credibility as a military power mm -hmm. and a reliable ally to its enemies and its allies mm -hmm. around the world. So there was a little grain of truth in the domino theory. I mean, we, generally communism uh, kind of jumps borders like a you know like a like a virus or something. You oh, see yeah. how it jumped from from <laughs> Russia to China and then over to virus. Korea. Mm -hmm. Right, we squash that, and then it, you know, then it jumped down to Vietnam, and then over to Laos and Cambodia. And there was a fear that, you know, this would keep going, and and the dominoes would end up going to Saudi Arabia. Oh, and that was the. Uh, I read that in the, in the book Diplomacy by Henry Kissinger. That there, so there was a little fear of that. You know, that's where the dominoes went. They thought this might jump over to India, 
on up into the Middle East and then get into the oil fields. So that was a concern. So that, so that domino theory, there, there was a little grain of truth in that, but that wasn't the whole thing. They were also worried about, you know, just encouraging insurgencies popping up anywhere. Angola, uh, for instance, and uh, Nicaragua. And, uh, you know, the Dominican Republic, actually, the Dominican Republic, you know, had a flare-up that we, we put the kibosh on in the, in the early 60s. Um, there were uh, several countries, I can't remember all the names of them now, quite a few in Africa, that had, uh, you, know, it, you know, budding communist insurgencies going on. And the feeling was that if we didn't stand up to the Soviet bloc, or the communist bloc, which was... Russia and China. We didn't stand up to them. Uh, you know that just would have been pro provided encouragement for for spreading communist revolutions in other countries. And the other thing is, so part of this is to avoid that. Part of it, the other part of it was for our allies. So they would see that we would honor our treaties. And we would, you know, and we would be there for them if there was a if there was a problem with this communist bloc, and therefore they would not then appease, uh, you know, China and Russia in any any negotiations that came up. If there's uh, if there's a little worry or doubt that you won't be a credible ally, then uh, you know there's gonna, there's going to be a tendency to, to start appeasing that that other that other power. And everybody everybody kind of thought that well, you know. The world's going to go one way or the other. It's going to be a showdown, and it's either going to go to Russia or us. And uh, fortunately, it went to us. Uh, I would like to claim all the victory, you know, for for our uh, side because of the, our military power and all that stuff. But uh, I heard uh, one, probably I would say, credible story attributing it more to Gorbachev. Oh. And he's another he's a guy I would like to read more about. So one thing about doing these speeches I find out is that when you start getting into this stuff, uh, you start, it just kind of goes on. One thing leads to another and you start finding all this other interesting stuff to read about. So I would encourage maybe you guys to, uh, uh, to look into that and read Gorbachev's biography and uh, see what you think about that stuff. But, uh, but in a nutshell, that is is really why there's no evidence uh, to doubt that. I mean, you're, you know, there's, there's nothing uh, to support any of those other reasons why why we were there. Um, the lesson to be learned from this is that when you appear weak. If you don't have a strong military, and I brought this up uh, a couple of months back, we had some guy here that had some kind of a had some kind of a weird peace plan that was real ambiguous. He's coming back. <laughs> What's that? He's coming back. Is he really? <laughs> and he's going to be a lot more prepared this time. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, you know, I told him. I think I told him. Uh, or at least I wanted to tell him, I can't remember if I raised my hand and got a chance to say anything or not, but uh, there's really uh, two things, and I come up with, came up with a third one, to guarantee peace. And number one is you have to have that capable military power. You've got to have troops, you've got to have the equipment, uh, the Navy, the Air Force, all that stuff, the missiles, and no, uh, number one, you have to have all that stuff capability. Number two is you have to have the will of the people to to use it. And I came. And number three, uh, that I, that I came up with on my own that I thought is that you also have to have the resolve of the politicians. Uh, if you have a capable military, and you have the will of the people, but then you have a bunch of people like Dennis Kucinich or Jan Schakowsky in office, the oh, 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 right to use it, what, what good is it? You know, they'll, they'll be, they'll be walking all over you. Uh, here's, a, uh, here's, a, here's, a little, here's a little quote right from Uncle Joe Stalin for you. Hey, Uncle Joe. Uh, all right. This is, uh, this is Stalin, uh, Stalin mocking uh, our military capability and the 
collective resolve of the United States. Yeah. Uh, he says, no, Americans don't know how to fight. Right. After the Korean War in particular, they have lost the capability to wage a large-scale war. Mm -hmm. They are pitting their hopes on the atom bomb and air power. Yeah. But one cannot win a war with that. One needs infantry. And they don't have much infantry. The mm -hmm. infantry they do have is weak. They are fighting little Korea, and already people are weeping in the USA. What will happen if they start a large-scale war? Then perhaps everyone will weep. So that was something that uh, Stalin said. Uh, related to that, in World War II, there's a, a German guy named Hakim von Ribbentrop, foreign minister. Joachim. Ribbentrop. It's it Joachim von Joachim? Joachim. 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 Von Ribbentrop, okay, foreign minister, foreign minister of National Socialist Germany. Yes. And he says that the fact that the United States has reacted to Japan's occupation of Indochina, remember Japan occupied Indochina earlier before, before we got involved in World War II. The fact that the United States has reacted to Japan's occupation of Indochina only with economic sanction, the fact that Roosevelt, that the Roosevelt Churchill meeting produced only words, and the fact that the United States has made the hopeless and almost desperate attempt to keep Japan out by means of insincere negotiations are clear signs of weakness on the part of the United States, proving that it will, it will not risk any serious military action against Japan. This is no news to the military expert, for he has long known that the Army and the Air Force of the United States are not yet ready and that its Navy is still inferior to the Japanese Navy. Moreover, a large majority of the American people are opposed to war. Obviously, he was wrong, right? So that's what Ribbentrop said. But the Nazi. thing is, that when you appear weak, How did when you appear Nazi. weak, this is what draws a war in. So all these, you know, guys who's war resistant leagues and, and, uh, and Red Charlie and, and Brad. Uh, what's, uh, hey, uh, what's Brad's last name? Little. Brad Little. Brad Little. Yeah, Brad Little. I don't know, he's not here tonight. You know, he's the former past this presidential candidate. He comes here quite often. But, you know, all these guys, they want to quit military spending and give everybody no, a big fat check happen. to go out and blow on a big TV and some beer and cigarettes and stuff. Well, that's exactly how you get a war. When you're, when you look weak to your enemy. If you're, if, you, if you're strong, you know, you're going to avoid it. He's reading the now, Nazi handbook. I told you this is, this is a quote from, from Mao Zedong himself, who was uh, basically a mentor of Ho Chi Minh and sort of the consigliori. Uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh often got advice from Mao. And this is what he says in, uh, in 1964, October 5th, 1964. It is impossible for the United States to send many troops to South Vietnam. The Americans together have 18 army divisions. They have to keep half of these divisions, i.e. nine of them, at home, and can send abroad the other nine divisions. Among these divisions, half are in Europe, and half are in the Asia-Pacific region. And they have stationed more divisions in Asia than elsewhere in the region, namely three divisions. One is in South Korea, one in Hawaii, and the third one, and it says original, not clear, so they weren't sure what he said for the third one. They also placed fewer than one division of Marine Corps uh, troops in Okinawa in Japan. So we know that you know that's something Mao was looking at. You know, they look at the, they look at our troop counts. You know, and they look at our equipment and stuff, and they look at our will to fight. And uh, like I said, when you when you appear appear weak to your enemies, that's what gets them to move against you, or perhaps move against you know your allies. And that's why. Uh, uh, you know, the War Resisters League and pacifists and all that. That is why they are so wrong. Uh, if you want to uh, avoid war and have peace, you have to be prepared for war. So I am with my neighbor. Mm. Uh. Yeah. Now, um, <coughs> in, the, in the early, in the early <coughs> part of, of our involvement in Vietnam, China was was basically supporting North Vietnam, helping them out. They did send uh, 
overall uh, over 300,000 troops in the North Vietnam, uh, about 170 some thousand at a time, and uh, they took largely uh, kind of a little more or less support roles that enabled North Vietnam to free people up to send to the south to fight the Americans. So the Chinese troops were there operating the, uh, the Soviet supply air defense system, which was pretty, pretty elaborate, uh, helping to build roads, you know, helping with logistics and things like that. Uh, the second half of the war, basically, the Soviet Union was really you know, doing all the heavy lifting as far as supplies. They were, they were supplying artillery, uh, they were supplying uh, you know, uh, trucks and uh, just all, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, about, uh, I think it was half um, of the money that the that, uh, Soviet Union gave to uh, satellite countries, about half of it was in that Vietnam effort. Uh, so we drained uh, you know, a considerable amount of money from Vietnam. The other half was split uh, between Cuba and North Korea. So, what's that? I think that's probably all I've got that's in the major, uh, you know, it's, it's really, it's not that, it's really not that uh, sophisticated or complicated uh, uh, of a thing. Uh, uh, that is essentially it. I think I should probably open the floor for questions because I'm sure you have more All right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I had my hand up first. Oh, yeah. All right, I'll go with you. Get a camera. Who do you consider won the Vietnam War? What's that? Who do you think won the Vietnam War? Well, if you look at, well, you know, you have to look at the Vietnam War was just a, you know, a chapter in the Cold War. It's just, just a part of the Cold War. We won the Cold War. Uh, you know, people say, well, we lost the Vietnam War, but, you know, there's different ways of losing. You know, you can run away or you can get thrown out. And uh, we more or less got thrown out, but we, we put up a good fight, you know. And we lost, you know, 58,200 Americans. And we, we estimated... At the time, we estimated that they lost 750,000 uh, Viet Cong and uh, North Vietnamese regulars. But in 1995, at a 20-year uh, celebration they had in Vietnam, they they actually admitted that their losses were of military Much higher. people were 1.1 million. And uh, now, one thing we were we were often criticized uh, for. Overcounting, over you know the body count, and that's something you know General Westmoreland you know was given a lot of grief, grief for that. And there was some overcount, over you know some let's see you know uh, fudging numbers early on, but that was mostly by the South Vietnamese guys who who wanted to make a good looking picture to get us involved. So they said, yeah, we're you know, we're killing all these guys. But when we got around, when we came into it. We didn't really fudge the numbers, but what happened was that, you know, you know that these totalitarian regi regimes are meticulous, uh, they keep meticulous track of, of things like that, Sometimes. and they, they also were really good about removing their wounded and their dead right away, so we would really never know. We just had to kind of use guesses that probably for every, every one confirmed body count dead, there was probably two wounded and things like that. But uh, 
you know, they sure took a, they got a hell of a beating. Now, there are a number of civilian, there's you know, the, the, the uh, I've seen different numbers on civilian body counts. There may have been, uh, you know, there may have been 900,000 civilians killed as well. Uh, so, you know, they lost a couple million people probably. And if you look at it in that respect, it looks like, it looks like we won, if you're going to count, if you're going to count that way. Don't you but, consider the fact that an intel plant opened up there last year a fact that we won? Uh, you know what? Well, you know one thing I was uh, surprised to see when my uh, my boss sent me some pictures while he was over there. He sent me a picture of a of a supermarket shelf, and it had Pringles on it. And uh, one of the one of the Pringles cans was it was seaweed flavor, and it's something <laughs> I've never seen here. But you know they have they are um, actually just kind of recently, just now kind of switching, kind of taking a cue from China. Just starting to open up some free market reforms now. I looked at a number of charts, things like GDP and you know income per person and things like that, and they were they were basically just flat. Matter of fact, I looked at Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and they were all just flat ever since the, since the end of the war. Until recently, they started going up a little bit. But meanwhile, you look at China, you know, Japan, and Singapore, and everybody else, and they're all zooming. But so they're, they're still a planned economy, but they're just now starting some some free market reforms there. And uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, like I said, I think they'll I think they'll come along. What are, what that means we won? Like, well, we won the Cold War, you know, and communism is is you know tends to be retrenching, and uh, you know global trade is on the move. So. Oh, Walmart sweatshop. Right. Walmart's been the best thing that happened to this. Yeah, I, I got a whole bunch of questions, but I'll just start with this one. How can you stand there and say we won the Cold War? The United States of America is destitute. If you think we won the Cold War, then you got to write out a check right now to pay $50,000, which is your share of the debt, and you cannot make $1 or earn $1 or spend $1 on anything, not your food, not your transportation, not even on water, until you pay $50,000. How can you say we won the Cold War when every living human being, including 85-year-old guys and infants that were just born last week, owe $50,000? How can you say we won the Cold War? Well, the fact is that the fact is, so you owe fifty thousand dollars. All the old ones, <laughs> not yet. That's correct. Fully. All of us. That's not all from. That's not all though from military spending. There's, you know, there's that's. There's all kinds of spending that goes on. Military is just part of it. How much would it cost if? No, no, you got to answer the question, not ask. Yeah. We get to ask. No. You get to answer. You <laughs> <laughs> are not moderating this meeting. Neither are you. <laughs> okay. Next uh, we question. bankrupted the Soviet we won, Union. Soviet Union collapsed. We won. We had to spend a lot of money to do it, but it was worth it. You know, we've got the world on a uh, you know on a capitalist track. Yes. Nothing has elevated the people of the world like capitalism has. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the talk, you said that, um, well, in this listing, um, you said that Vietnam was worth the price paid in blood and treasure. Mm -hmm. Part of that price, was part of that price Cambodia and having the Khmer Rouge come in and, and decimate Cambodia? Right, right. Well, by, by us being there, you know, we prolonged that for about 10 years. And a couple million people were killed over there. Uh, and like I said, we, by us being there, we prolonged it. Uh, a lot of people were able to escape. Um, I forgot how many uh, came over, came from North Vietnam to the South Vietnam. Uh, even right after, you know, right after it was partitioned, a lot came down simply because they were Catholics and uh, they were nine hundred thousand. Was it nine hundred thousand that came down? I know that, that came out. and a lot came from uh, you know of course after the war you know uh, a lot fled so I mean you know we saved a lot of people and you know there was a big big brain drain out of out of South Vietnam a lot of skilled people a lot of educated people came over here 
What was the genocide in Cambodia worth the price? No, knowing that we helped create. We didn't help create that. What? Yeah, we did. Yeah. 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 You know, when we bombed Cambodia, that didn't create the vacuum for the Khmer Rouge to come in and. Well, uh, well, we're you know we've got no control over what the the you know Khmer Rouge decides to do. You know they were um, you know uh, Sihanouk was you know was uh, was helping out the Vietnamese. He was letting them use the ports. He was letting them use the. Uh, uh, you know, part of the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail, so you know that was you know his decision to to enlarge the war, and uh, Johnson kind of uh, avoided going over there. But it, when Nixon came in, he he realized that uh, you know hey, you know if they're taking that that involvement in the war, then they're going to have to get you know pay the consequences of. Was Kennedy wrong during the Cuban Missile Crisis? We didn't actually engage in war. Would Kennedy have been more distinguished and correct if he just bombed or dropped the and created a hot war and yeah. the Cuban Missile Crisis? Yeah. No comment. Maybe we should have fired at them. And would that have been a better because we would have looked mightier or, or we would have looked more powerful or more first. respectful? Yeah, we would not have Bob talking to us here. Okay. Uh, yeah, if as uh, if I understand you right, you're suggesting that our primary reason for going in there was to demonstrate to the world, especially to our possible allies, that we are capable of standing up against an aggressor nation, yada, yada, yada. If that were the case, why would we pick a country which no one has successfully been able to occupy and conquer. The Chinese tried it in the 8th and 12th century, the French tried it in the 19th century, the Japanese tried it in the 20th century. They were able to control the cities as we were, but nothing beyond that. Wouldn't our planners in Washington, who are not complete idiots, have picked a country as a test case, if you will, uh, that we were pretty darn sure that we were going to win. Well, no, unfortunately, you don't really get to pick, uh, you know, where where you're going to fight uh, all the time. You know, the thing was there was a smart generals do. There, there was a uh, there was something called Sheet of South right. Southeast Asia uh, Treaty Organization. Treaty Organization, and uh, you know, we were more or less, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, obligated. To help to help Vietnam. So our goal wasn't to take over Vietnam to get to get land or rubber or anything like that. Our goal was to stand up to the communist bloc and to show everybody else that we would stand up to them. And so don't get any ideas about starting any insurgencies anywhere else because you're going to get you'll get the same thing. We will we will help you know our allies uh, defend uh, themselves against you. Uh, and uh, and also you know prove again prove to our to our other allies that, uh, that we were that we were credible, that we would stand by our word, and uh, we didn't want to, we didn't want our allies to kind of you know buck, scare, get scared and buckle to and capitulate to Russians and Chinese in future negotiations about this. And what did our allies think of us after the fall of Saigon? Well, after the fall of Saigon, yeah, there was uh, yeah there was um, you know. Uh, yeah, there, there, there was there was issues there. There was a number of other uh, that that empowered a, a number of other insurgencies to, to, to start. And unfortunately, well, I mentioned what sort of what Vietnam had to do with Korea. The similarity is that when you the people will support you until you get about ten or fifteen thousand casualties, and that's about that's sort of what happened in Korea. Too. Once we reached about ten or fifteen thousand casualties, then the public turns against you. And the thing was, it, Washington had to walk a, a, a careful line here. We didn't want to lose support for fighting the Cold War altogether. We didn't want to lose support for that. So we kind of had to, you know, draw Vietnam to a close. We had so many, you know, now we, you know, we're well over the 15, 10, 15,000 casualty numbers. Uh, the public's really going bonkers, uh, protesting us and everything. 
because we don't want to lose support for the Cold War overall. So that's why we kind of had to make you know sacrifice to get out. But what we should have done, I think, is sort of like what we did in Korea. Uh, we probably should have put a perimeter around the cities and not let any supplies in or out, any any military <laughs> supplies in or out, and not go out and engage <coughs> the Vietnamese out in the in the jungles and stuff like we did. But it kind of unfortunately, uh, we had a couple of big skirmishes in uh, 1965, I think in November of 65, no Northern Tree area, and uh, why we, we we killed we killed a lot of them, and that gave Westmoreland uh, you know encouragement to to keep Keep going out there and chasing those commies out in the woods, and then, uh, you know, then we get out there and, get, and we, then we take a lot of casualties a lot of times. Now, we killed a lot more of them, but we also took a lot of casualties or something. We probably could have played it safer by just encircling the cities. We're more or less the, the, uh, the uh, you know, free, you know, Vietnamese were. Uh, and the, most of the, the peasantry and the jungle areas, the smaller areas were were communist control of it. Mm. And that probably would have worked. It would have lasted a long time, but that probably would have been our salvation. Although I have heard from, I did hear from a, you know, one friend of mine who's a Vietnam vet said, no, that wouldn't have worked either. They still would have got the supplies in somehow. Uh. Maybe they would have, maybe they would have tunneled or something. That might not have worked, but I think that's probably what we, what we should have done, rather than having the big engagements, you know, out there. Oh, the we jungles. have a lot of questions coming in. Gene Harker. Uh, Bob, in your, uh, research on this, uh, you, you said that uh, you mentioned the Soviet Union, you mentioned China, they were both, at least my understanding, clearly communists at the time. Were they in complete agreement or was there uh, some dissent between the two? So how did how did those two relate to Vietnam? Well, they were, they were sort of, uh, they sort of had an uneasy Alliance. They were kind of in competition to see who was going to evolve to be the, you know, the the leader of world revolution, world communist revolution. So they were kind of, uh, you know, in competition for that. However, you know, China, China wasn't the industrial powerhouse then that it is today. So uh, they didn't have the wherewithal to provide uh, a lot of the sophisticated things like MIGs. You know, the Soviet Union provided jets. Uh, pilots, uh, they provided the sophisticated anti-aircraft uh, system there, which was actually pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good. So, uh, yeah, but they had an uneasy alliance. They were in sort of a competition to see who was going to become the world leader of communist country. You know, and be also a member of the world. Yeah. I, I understand uh, uh, exiting World War II. Uh, some of our allies, France and Great Britain, scurried back to their colonies. And, you know, obviously we're talking about Vietnam, so we're talking about France here. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, you know, in the waning years of when French, the French were in control of that area, what, what caused us to come in? Uh, the theme of, one of your themes of your speech is it was an imperative war. We had to go to war. Uh, and a little side note here, uh, you mentioned there was, there was a high volunteer American volunteer rate, something like 70% of our people there were volunteers. Um, so I'm wondering what brought us into that war? Uh, was there an underlying security pact with France or the underlying colony? And, and what, what emotional trends in the states caused such a high uh, volunteerism uh, for this war? It's not like we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. We're talking about abstractions, domino theories. Why did our young people want to go to this war? Well, first let's talk about France. Uh, France didn't really leave when World War II started. It's just that the, the, the French rulers in, in uh, Indochina became part of the Vichy government. So they were more or less, uh, you know, allied with Germany and Japan. And Japan came in there and sort of co-operated co it with the Vichy French that were in, in power. Um, then, uh, then the Vichy French started having secret talks uh, with the Free French. I think they knew that you know writing was on the wall, the war was going to end. And then the Japanese 
didn't trust them. They found out about it. They didn't trust them. Then the Japanese took more of a more of a powering command of the place. And then, of course, when the tables turned, once we once we nuked Japan, then they they had to surrender. Then the French were back. Then they were top dogs again, and uh, they wanted to stay there. And I believe Eisenhower kind of capitulated to them and let said, "Well, you know, we'll we'll, we'll let you keep this." And uh, you know, and then they fought it out until until '54, and the Geneva, Geneva Accords came along. Ho Chi Minh was given to the North, and the Communists, and then the Free People were allowed to stay in the South. With the Vietnamese Nationalist Movement, or the French versus the Vietnamese Nationalist Movement. Well, dur during World War II, I mean, there was a there was a movement. I suppose you could call it a nationalist movement, but more or less led by by Ho, Ho Chi Minh. They were more or less against the French and the Japanese. Just like, just like in China, uh, Mao, uh, Mao, Mao had the Communist Party, the CCP. They sort of briefly united with the Nationalists, with the KMT of Chiang Kai-shek, uh, against the Japanese. Again, they kind of had an uneasy alliance, but everybody knew that they were going to duke it out. And they told the West that, oh, you know, after we get these Japanese out of here, we'll have a coalition government. You know, that's the thing they, they commonly do. But, each one of them knew that they were going to duke it out as soon as, as soon as the West got out of the way, uh, as soon as we got out of there. We did have some troops there in China just to keep the Russians from coming in, but uh, we pulled those out, and uh, you know they start duking it out, and uh, then uh, the CCP, now the CCP, started capturing a lot of the American weapons, and we we provided the Chiang Kai-shek with a lot of a lot of weaponry, and uh, and uh, Mao was capturing it, so. Uh, you know, we're using American weapons against the, 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 the nationalists. And I forgot what the rest of the question was about Vietnam. Uh, yeah, well, why, 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 what made the young people uh, volunteer in such great numbers? Well, you know what? I got a feeling. This is not something. I, this is not something I read about, really. But uh, I just uh, I did see some documentary films, and I listened to uh, uh, some other speeches, on some podcasts, and. I kind of got a feeling that this was the, the, the TV generation. And I think these kids were exposed to all the, the jingoism or patriotism following World War II, and all the, the movies and everything. And you know that 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 that, that idea of that, that military life, you know, the medals, the honor, that's very seductive. You know, uh, there's the, the GI Bill. You know. Uh, you know, there's a, you know, a lot of these kids, like a, you know, a lot of the Vietnam vets I know, you know, their dads were in World War II. You know, this is something you did, especially if you look at the South. <coughs> you know, there's military families, families that have, you know, this long history of military people, and uh, that's just something you do. You know, I mean, you you want to show, you know, you want to show, you want to give something back, you want to fight for your country, and all that. You've got the apple pie. And the, the flag and all that, the Fourth of July parades, and you see all the guys yeah. marching, and you want to, you know, you want to be part of that. Yeah. Okay, Don. All right, um, Bob. When I I came in a little late, when I first came in, you were you were saying that that our fighting, the U.S. fighting in the, in the Vietnam War, prevented the Philippines and Indonesia from going communist. Yeah, yeah. Now, how, how's, what? Yeah, right. Malaysia and Singapore too. And, and Malaysia and, and, and Singapore and too, you say. Okay, how? Yeah. Well, uh, because we uh, we showed that we, you know, we would come in there and do what it takes and we, we would support the anti-communist movement. But, but, but what was the causal relationship between the Vietnam War and the fact that, that, that these countries, you name, uh, have never had a communist government? Well, they were going to go communist. Wait, wait, let, let Bob answer. <coughs> Which countries have never had a communist government? Uh, well, the, the Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Singapore, the four countries that Bob mentioned. Well, I think it's because the, 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 the insurgencies in those countries realized that uh, that the anti-communist forces had us to depend on. We would help them out with whatever it took, you know, if it was people, if it was uh, weaponry or advisors or whatever. That it wasn't. They weren't going to be a pushover. You know, you're not going to be able to just go thug. You know, like thugs. 
push these places over. Uh, we, you know, they would have, you know, our help. They can depend on us to provide weapons or, and people or whatever to fight them. Mm. And I think that's. I think that was it. Oliver. Right. Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, I'm Charles. Red Charlie. Wanda. Red Charlie. Red Charlie. Red Charlie. Red Charlie. Red Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Been waiting around for a while. She forgot. Maybe it'll, it'll come back to your home. All right. <coughs> yeah, Bob. He said that if a nation experienced casualties of ten and fifteen thousand, that's that's it for the war. They've had it. Mm -hmm. Yet you come along then and you say the Vietnamese people lost over a million soldiers. Well, that's right. And then yeah. the million civilians, at least. And I must say, what explanation could you get for the indomitable fighting spirit? Or f are they fighting well, for freedom-loving you know, people well, or well, self-determination? I mean, this is a magnitude of what? What's that effect? What's 10 well, to a million? It's, it's like this. It's the same thing that more or less happened in China. The, the, the communists come down, Ho Chi Minh's guys come into a village. Here you got, uh, you know, one rich landowner that owns like, you know, a you know, thousand acres of uh, land, and then you got a hundred guys. So they like. Then you have a hundred guys that don't have squat, and then so they the, like so the commies will say, hey, how about if we kill that guy yeah. and we give each one of you ten acres? Yeah. Who, who's That's down good. with that? Good deal. Well, they all raise their hands. It's okay. Yeah. Follow me. We'll do it. So they That's like they communism. Do. They went. They went on this, 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 you know, this, uh, you know, this path of, of murder. You know, uh, <laughs> well, it was beneficial to them. It was. It was. They called it land reform, but that means you know, murder the the, the rich landowners and divide their land That's and wealth good. and fuck <laughs> livestock up with, with the poor people so people don't have any. Yeah. 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 So that's easy to get recruits that way. So they liked that. Well, of course they did. So we said they can't attack. do what they want. Anybody here? What about self-determination? I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, they, you know, oh, I these, these peasant people, these peasant Vietnamese, they're, they're not, uh, you know, they're not real deep, educated intellectuals, you know. But one thing they understand is that I don't have any land. I have to work for somebody else and you know, eke out a subsistence uh, level versus having my own land and having self-determination for myself. And sure, they'll, they'll uh, you know, and that's, and that's what Mao, you know, that's what Mao did. I mean, Mao had the peasantry on the country. That's what he did. They went to the countryside, they murdered the rich landowners, they divided the land up, gave it to the, spread it among the poor peasants, and they were, they were behind him 100%. And the, and the city, that's why the cities were more or less, uh, you know, KMT, but uh, but even they didn't like the KMT because, you know, they were, they were largely corrupt, and, and Chiang Kai-shek put a lot of the, the, the old uh, guard back in, you know, to run things, politicians, those guys were all corrupt, so they, so it was, so China ended up being a lost cause too. Okay, Andy. Yeah. Bob, uh, in, in all your research, did you come across any of the uh, the ex-military people that said it was commonly known among the troops that were there that there was a a, a, a common perception of Vietnamese people? viewed the American Army as an occupying invading force. And that's a, uh, that they were actually fighting, you know, the concept, I don't think the Vietnamese were fighting for their country to throw us out. Oh yeah, I, th I think there was, I think there was probably think some of that. You think that's a popular myth, that they welcomed us in there? Well, no, I think there's, I think there's, uh, you know, there's probably some of that I think is probably legitimate. Uh, but for the most part, uh, this was, this this uprising, more or less, was not a grassroots uprising out of South Vietnam. This was, you know, the Viet Minh, the Viet Cong. These were, this was a wholly owned subsidiary of the North Vietnamese, you know, Communist Party. You think the South Vietnamese weren't really helping at all? I mean, they they just they were innocent bystanders. Well, why, they, why did they, they all flood down to South Vietnam? Vietnam? Why did they all flood up to the north? You know, when they when they created the division, if they were in love with you know communism and Ho and the, you know North Vietnamese, but instead it was the other way around, like it always has been. They all, just like in Cuba, you know, they all flood to the 
for the freedom. Nobody wants to stay there and live under a totalitarian regime yeah, unless you're people like Greg Charlie that want to get in on the land grab, you know. <laughs> All right, the lady's back. When you quote, you say that the, that the price in blood and treasure was worth it. There are still people who are paying the price for this war. And a lot of it was left in the ground. And I'm talking about dioxin. And I lived in Niagara Falls for 20 years. I cared for the children of Grand Island as their school nurse. And they move people out of the Love Canal, and they relocate them. The Love Canal became a ghost town in Niagara Falls because of dioxin from the, from the Defense Department and Hooker Chemical. We're talking about children and adults. I cared for children that had seizure disorders, leukemias, terrible problems, diabetes. They're discovering that the veterans from the war have developed type 2 diabetes because of oh. dioxin. Yeah, well, let me tell you something about dioxin. And I can tell you that I personally, my health was affected because I lived downwind of the Love Canal Reclamation Project. If you say it's worth it, then you have to talk about the living people that are pay still paying the price for this war. Yeah, you're and talking about us. the Agent Orange and Agent the... Agent Orange dioxin is the active ingredient in Agent Orange to the foliage mm -hmm. that was used in Vietnam. Tell me that it is worth it, these living people that are the, the inheritors of oh. this deposit. Um, actually, the, uh, I, did, I did look into that. I can't remember exactly which... Uh, which which paper I saw it in, but uh, actually the uh, the concentrations used, you know, were were were, were pretty small, and dioxin uh, decays in sunlight, and for the most part, when they sprayed, uh, you know, it was it was uninhabited, or else soldiers didn't go into it until so you know after a, until a safe period. When it had time to 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 At decay, Love Canal, it was so very well, Love Canal is not Vietnam. I mean, I don't know what happened to Love Canal, but that's but that's not Vietnam. Now maybe they had higher concentrations, or whatever. But Vietnam had, you know, they they used lower concentrations, and again, it was you know, people didn't go in there until after the safe period, you know, uh, of sunlight to, to to break it down. So it wasn't. Uh, it, it wasn't all that bad uh, in, in Vietnam. So, right? It's, it's um, greatly exaggerated. I mean, there may be some people that handled it, you know, that were exposed to larger concentrations that had some problems, but the overall, uh, you know, general forces, no, they don't, uh, you know, they they were more, more or less, you know, okay. They had permissible exposure levels to Rhonda, then Ernie. Okay, so uh, I'm going to, not specifically her point, but you said something about the reason that the American public started to be against it was the number of casualties. After it hit a certain number of casualties, then the American public turned away. Yeah. But isn't it true that part of what happened had to do with the kinds of media attention where we saw for the first time pictures of what actually happened in war, uh, in Life magazine, and other things? and. Isn't it also true that there were different types of warfare going on? Like, what was the role of torture in the Vietnam War? Uh, well, a lot of Americans were tortured, who were captured, who were, who were probably tortured. Uh, there wasn't too much torture going on the other way. Uh, you know, we had a couple of uh, we had a couple of atrocities. Of course, Me Lai being the, the big one, everybody knows about. There was a, there was a smaller one. I can't remember the name of it now anymore. But basically, uh, our atrocities, especially compared to the North Vietnamese, difference between oh, night and day. We were real. When we, when the North Vietnamese, when the North Vietnamese took. Media were not representative of what was going on the rest of the time. A few bad apples. Uh, one and now, every now and then. Oh please! I mean, there, one full at a time. There was virtually no torture. 
soldier um, uh, documentary about the, the military in zero. Uh, the atrocities that I saw in that, on that, on that documentary were pretty much uh, unspeakable. Okay, I take it you're not a veteran, uh, at least, uh, and your references, you got one reference, I've got at least 15 that That's I've read. Uh, did you attempt to interview any Vietnam combat veterans? Because you know what? Uh, I have a hard time believing. I know you didn't visit the wall because basically you said to me here, 70% of people who were killed in that in the in the battle were officers and pilots. No, I didn't Damn. say that. But, but I, I, I I walked the wall. Okay, I'm a veteran myself. I've served for 24 years. There's the, the, the bulk of the names on that on those walls are grunts, marines. Very few officers and military on there. In fact. Many officers were fragged because they, they basically were sending these guys and going to battle for, for nonsense. My only other uh, uh, talk about what you did say was uh, heavy, palacious firefights. Very few palacious firefights. There was the, the, Drang, the La Drang Valley, the Tet Offensive, and there was a Marine base down in South south of Saigon. The bulk of the fighting, the bulk of the fighting was hit and run. They did the same damn thing that our patriots, our insurgents did with the British. They would never engage a, a, a military force that was superior to them. They hit and run. Like I said, three, maybe four major palatial firefights. That's it. Did Mike, you interview Mike? at the end of me? Did you uh, interview any yes, yes, I did. You did? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. okay. By the way, the fragging number is that's, okay. another, that's another greatly exaggerated myth. I believe the, the number was, uh, uh, again, I can't remember where I got it from because I got like that so, so much material. All right. There was uh, about 270. So much material. You only, okay. you only gave me Michael Lynn. You only gave oh, me Michael just, Lynn. Well, that was, just, that was my, principal, my principal book, but there's, uh, you know, there's countless things I, you know, on the. Uh, on the internet, uh, a couple guys, a couple Vietnam vets, uh, compiled stuff from uh, you know 15 or 30 sources. Uh, you the Winter Soldier. I did you see Winter Soldier, Soldier, and you know the business about pushing the Vietnamese out of the aircraft. You know that's been that's been way blown over. I wrote read, read a story from a guy who was in a helicopter uh, with, with one of those that happened and what, what happened was that a Vietnamese soldier, a North Vietnamese soldier that was wounded that they were trying to take to a hospital died in the helicopter. He had a bad abdominal wound, he had a bandage on. So they decided to to get, well, to, to, to drop him off to be buried. And they were hovering about 10 feet off the ground and they were lifting this guy out and they lost their grasp on him and he fell down. But he was already dead. But now guys in the back saw this, and you know, in about you know a month or two, now this story had grown that this helicopter was 500 feet in the air and you know thrown out a live guy. Okay. But uh, uh, so a lot of that's again, you know, a lot of that's way way overblown. All right, Jim Bolger to, and then uh, Pat Butler to speculate about what may happen in the future. Will we encounter another major power war within the next century or not? <laughs> another major power war? Like us versus right. Russia? I, I, I said another major power war, like we had in World War II or World War I. Or do you think that phase of warfare is behind us and we're just going to be dealing with little mini insurgencies the rest of the century? Well, I got a feeling it's going to be the little mini insurgencies. And I want to address one thing this gentleman spoke about. You know, early on in the war, we had some big engagements, and the North Vietnamese got their butts whooped pretty good. 
because of the fact that we had air power. So if they ever had a, if they ever had a large, uh, you know, group assembled, we would call in airstrikes and they would get decimated. So what they had to, two things they started doing. One thing they started doing was fighting closer in. So they'd get really close to us, so you couldn't have air power. You know, you could not no longer use air power because it wasn't accurate enough. And the other thing they started doing was, you know, these, you know, these small hit, hit and runs. And uh, you know, except for any other, you know, certain things that they did try the big ones. Again, it was part of their, uh, <coughs> they have this, uh, part of their, their theory, they have a, uh, some steps that they use that the communists follow to do this. And it, it was continuous argument within the North Vietnamese power structure of whether they should do these, these big all-out strikes or not. Like one of them was, uh, was you know, k San. And then they had the, the Tet Offensive, you know, they tried it again. And by the way, the Tet Offensive, they, when they took away, they murdered uh, uh, at least 2,500 or 2,800 uh, teachers and doctors, you know, and civilians. We, yeah. we, found their, uh, we found the graves after we took way back. Yeah, but you still haven't quite answered the question in detail like I asked. <laughs> Well, I don't think we're going to have a big, giant conventional war anytime soon. I think those days are pretty much behind us. It'll be these type of terrorist wars or hit-and-run wars, you know, guerrilla type things. You know, I, don't, I think the days of the big, you know, the big confrontations are, All right. are pretty it's much over. Charles? Okay. Yeah, you called it Ribbentrop. Are you advancing the notion that the United States should adopt the foreign policy? Yet Ribbentrop was like the Secretary of State of Nazi Germany. Do <laughs> you think we should adopt the foreign affairs policy of Adolf Hitler? No, I'm reading him as an example of, of he was looking at our power and saying, ah, we, you know, we're not ready, you know, we don't have the uh, capability yet, and, you know, all that, that Japan is still superior to us and all this stuff. And that's what gave, you know, that's what gives your enemy, you know, encouragement to attack you is when you, when you don't have uh, a, a credible deterrent force built up of people and equipment. That's why I read, read Ribbentrop. Ribbentrop, Mao, and Stalin, those are the three I read. And they all, all three are virtually, you know, identical. They, they look at your troop counts, they look at the will of your people, and they go, ah, you know, these Americans are crybabies, you know, they, 10 or 15,000 people die and they start crying and they want to plot. So let's go, you know, attack them, or let's go take over a country, we don't have to worry about about the Americans. You know, that's, that's, that's what happens when you when you're like Butler, that. didn't I just recognize you? No, you question? didn't. No, you didn't. No, oh, only one. You said you were going to. But oh, uh, Ernie. Raise your yeah. Ernie. Well, go with Pat. <coughs> have, you, have you got a question, Pat? I have a question, uh, and it'll be quick. In your research, did you uh, run across any of the attitudes of senior, active, and retired military personnel, I'm talking about four stars and up, uh, toward our involvement in uh, Vietnam? Uh, I ask this because you must surely be aware of the fact that somebody in the early 1960s says, quote, anyone involved in a land war in Southeast Asia needs his head examined. That man was General Douglas MacArthur. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that opinion was actually, you know, pretty common in a lot of places. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I heard similar, similar things. I, I heard some, I listened to some tapes of Johnson, the Johnson administration. I heard him, you know, you'd have having these late night conversations with, with senators and congressmen, and he would say say things like, "Well, this Vietnam War is the biggest goddamn mess I've ever seen. I don't know how we're going to get out of it and stuff like that." I mean, yeah, I mean, everybody knew it was. So, isn't it the you know, utter utter example of the highest level of stupidity of the lowest to go into a war like that against the advice of some of your finest experts? No, again, we had to make the stand against the, the communist bloc. And that's where the stand was going to be in Indochina, and so that's again you don't really get to pick and choose all this is going to be. Our problem, though, I think, was the fact that we kind of let the generals fight the previous war. They wanted to go out into the jungles and engage the enemy instead of just taking basically a defensive position, putting you know ringing the major cities and protecting those and not letting any military in or out. Because you know, the the Viet Vietnamese were or the Viet Cong were running a basically a terrorist campaign in the cities. They were assassinating uh, politicians, uh, you know, uh, teachers, any opponents of, of, uh, of Ho Chi Minh and things like that. And, uh, you know, they're, they're blowing things up. And uh, 
tanks and, and, this, and the supplies were getting out. There were sympathizers in the cities that were sending supplies out to uh, where these guys were hiding. Okay. So no we probably should have burned. We probably should have had perimeters and, and done it that way. We would have had those casualties. Yeah, uh, Rhonda's question touched on this a little bit, but maybe you can expand. Um, the Vietnam War was initially popular, as are all wars, so it was Iraq and Afghanistan and everything else. Hmm. Uh, the popularity wanes. Uh, could you go into your opinion and your author's opinion uh, as to some more specifics as to why the popularity of uh, uh, of Vietnam wanes? Because Vietnam, I think, I, I'm not entirely correct on that. I think it was the first war that we were in, in a big time where there were major, major public uh, outcries against it. There was some even against World War II. A little bit more about Korea, but Korea lasted much shorter. Vietnam, there were huge demonstrations all over. Well, how, to what do you uh, attribute this? Well, um, the draft, the fact that we had a draft until 1972 had a lot to do with it. Because as soon as the draft ended, you notice almost overnight the protests stopped. Ooh. Almost overnight. So also volunteering stuff. So, uh, so the so so the draft, you know, was. I would say that's that's the big that's the big thing to look at. Once that draft stopped, then that was it. People people really didn't care anymore. All right, Mike Foley I, and uh, Gene uh, Gene Anderson yes, hasn't yes, spoken yes, before. Yes, no one. Thank I want to ask you about this business, but uh, please, we want Mike, oh, Gene. Gene, we'll get Gene has not had a question. Oh, okay. Uh, some uh, follow up on Pat a little bit. Uh, Mac Arthur spoke about the hazards and why we shouldn't be there. I heard them tapes that the president was speaking about. Mm -hmm. The guy wrote a book about it and he also had the tapes. I read uh, the Secretary of Defense, McNamara. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now, these are the top folks out there, people. If they said it was a bunch of junk, who wanted to be there if it wasn't these high rankings? Who, who is behind us being there? You said we want to show the world something. Who are the people that want to show the world? If the president, secretary of state, and all these people, Joe said it's a bunch of bullshit, who, who, explain something. Well, it's got to it's gotta be that, that top power group in Washington that sits around the cabinet, that sits around and advises the president. I mean, we know it was a... A horrible, uh, you know, it was it was a horrible, nasty place to be and do. But the thing is, though, we had to maintain our credibility. And I think, uh, you know, in Johnson, and I, I even had some. I, I remember I, I heard or read some quotes about from Johnson. That, you know, he, he was stuck in that. He was in that hard place. I mean, you know, again, we had to keep the. Uh, you know, now he's talking to the CIA and all that too. You know, he gets advice from a lot of people. And national there's this national security council and all this stuff. And again, we had to maintain that balance there where who, we didn't. Who was the people, otherwise, have to. Who was, a, who was the president listening to? Who was McNamara listening to? In the big time, Joan. John Foster Dulles. Who was that that had more influence than they had? That's yeah, what I'm well, saying. Dulles. The, the Dulles brothers. All right. Uh, yeah, and, and you know what? They're, I, I read so many names, they're just kind of all foggy in my head, but uh, in, the, in this book and in several other documents, you know, I read there's, you know, they just mentioned so many names of lesser people in the State Department and National Security Advisors and people even in, in the Pentagon. They weren't all, you know, uh, you know, that, that, that much against it. A lot of them wanted to, to say, well, we need more, we just need more troops and this, this and that. And you know what, look what happened when we stayed in Korea. They're, they're, that division is still there, and South Korea has still not been attacked. Mm -hmm. North Korea, we you know we pulled out of Vietnam, and you know like soon as we were gone, they, you know there they were down there, you know taking over the place and uh, you know inflicting uh, all their terror on the people in South Vietnam. And uh, you know maybe we should maybe we should have stayed and maintained the, the force uh, to keep it like Korea. But as far as I know, we're still in Korea. Elizabeth, you had your hand up a long time oh, ago. Oh, I just keep thinking my heart is just so sad when I think about war because 
would you agree, and I'm going to put this in a question form, wouldn't you agree that war is like hell, mm -hmm. and it brings out man's inhumanity to man, mm -hmm. that our freedom is not free, and right now my heart wants to say thank you to the veteran over there who served, what did he say, 24? Yeah. 24 years. I think, don't you agree that we need to thank our veterans for putting their lives on the line and fighting for the air that we're breathing here tonight? Oh, oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, definitely. And like war, I mean, war is war is war, you know? Like, we kill each other. Sad. Yep, yep, it is, but, you know. However, that, in whatever kind of question from you want to make of that, please, thank you. Yeah, but again, it's you know it's, it's sort of a, it's, a, it's a necessary evil if you want to fight like we did. You know, we we did the honorable thing. We we helped our allies fight against totalitarianism, against the totalitarianism regime, and uh, and uh, we ended up uh, you know more or less losing it. You know, losing it to them. Uh, but we put up a, a good fight, and we kept a lot of other countries from going communist. And the way things worked out, you know, we did win the Cold War. I mean, Russia collapsed. We don't have them to worry about anymore. Well, it's, hard to to integrate, about, right. it's hard to integrate that kind of reality into being human beings who care. We all live on the same planet. How do we take care of each other in an affirming, life-giving way? So it's, it's hard. Yeah. Okay, Mike Foley. No, no. no, the guy okay. in the red shirt. Okay. The oh, oh, guy in the red shirt. My wife says, all right, so your thesis is number one, that you need military preparedness right. to defend yourselves and right. keep the peace. Right. And your second thesis is that in the Vietnam War, um, it was worth it because the insurgencies throughout Southeast Asia saw that we were determined and therefore backed off. Is that a good? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So your opinion is that the United States would and, and you also, your, your third thing is that we had to show, demonstrate to our allies our determination, right? Mm -hmm. Three things. So you believe that after 1974, all the way maybe through 1990, that this country would have gone to war anywhere in Southeast Asia in a major military campaign mm -hmm. to defeat an insurgency. Is that? Is that my understanding? Well, Do you really believe that? Oh well, no. I mean, no. We we, we wouldn't have. That's that that Vietnam syndrome that we oh. would you know had oh, been suffering oh, until, God, until, until, until until they tell no, George Bush. Wait, 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 finally, wait, wait, wait. now you're saying that because oh. of what happened in Vietnam, <laughs> one of your thesis is failed, and that the aim of the war failed because we would not have gone in and shown our allies, maybe even in Europe, which was a big problem in the 1980s. That the Europeans believed we wouldn't fight for them. So the Vietnam War was a failure, if I hear you right, because it proved to our allies that we would not stay because the end result was that they had to go to the wrong syndrome. place for us. That's your that's taking your thesis and just looking at it. You know? <laughs> well, I don't know if I can interpret that very very clearly or not, but let me put it this way. <coughs> okay. It, so, so the experience of the Vietnam War did leave, uh, you know, the public and, um, you know, a lot of the, you know, liberal politicians, uh, you know, in that. No Republicans back the end of the war. Oh no, there, no, there were, there was, there's Republicans usually, you know, isolationists as well. Um, uh, that, that, that you know want to avoid uh, uh, war at all costs too. But, uh, you know, because of that bad taste left in our mouth from, from Vietnam, that, that did have, you know, what people call, you know, Vietnam Syndrome, and which we were sort of, uh, you know, sort of had, uh, you know, our hands tied behind our back from taking any action somewhere because everybody said, oh, no, there'll be another Vietnam, be another Vietnam, be another Vietnam. Kept hearing that over and over and over again until finally George Bush Sr., you know, broke the ice and uh, when we went into the, and in, into Kuwait in 1991, uh, or 1990, wherever I forget what year it was now. Yeah, we did a couple. Little, we did a couple little, you know, we had a couple little minor, minor things in there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no doubt that that Vietnam experience uh, 
you know, uh, I think severely uh, all right, handicapped us in our our defense uh, posture. Uh, Mike Foley. Yes. Yeah, it's just it's about your uh, uh, statement about we got to show our enemies we're strong. We got to reassure our allies. Supposedly, South Vietnam was our ally, but we sent a CIA murder squad to South Vietnam to murder the president of South Vietnam and the head of the South Vietnamese police. Mm -hmm. And then over a period of 16 years, the people of the United States sent approximately 3 million American soldiers to South Vietnam, our ally, and they were there to kill people in South Vietnam, who was our ally. And we never sent any soldiers, except there was a lot of airplane pilots, but we never sent any soldiers to North Vietnam to kill the people in North Vietnam who were our enemy. We sent people to South Vietnam, 3 million soldiers in South Vietnam, to kill people in South Vietnam, which was our ally. Now, how's this going to scare our enemies if we don't send anybody to kill our enemies? And how's this going to reassure our allies if we send 3 million soldiers over a period of 16 years to kill our allies? How is our allies going to be reassured of anything except if they ask us for help, we're going to send soldiers there to kill them? Well, first of all, the reason we didn't send troops into North Vietnam is because we correctly realized that that would draw China into the war. Mm -hmm. And matter of fact, in uh, somewhere in Lynn's book, there's a quote from, uh, I think it was Mao, that that's exactly what would have happened if we would have mm -hmm. gone into North Vietnam, they would have entered the war. Well, so what? We could have killed them too. They were well, our enemies, and we could show them we're tough. Well, that's, yeah, you, yeah. Like you, you said, know, we're trying to you know, show look our how many, enemies Look how tough. many of them there are, though. I mean, that, so that we we didn't, Johnson didn't want to get into a war with Chinese. We wanted to avoid that. You said we were in a war with China because you said they sent 300 soldiers to North Vietnam. They had 300. <coughs> they sent 300,000. Excuse me, 300,000. Yeah. yeah, but they they kind of stayed up there and, and did things like building roads and operated uh, anti-aircraft guns and things like that. But well, uh, how does it reassure our allies that we sent soldiers to our allies to kill them? But our our guys that were in uh, <coughs> our guys that were in South Vietnam weren't killing South Vietnamese. Yes, they were killing. Uh, South Vietnamese. They were killing South, South Vietnamese, Vietnamese communists if they were communists, if they were VCs, or if they were. But most of those guys were North Vietnam North Vietnamese that were coming down, probably through the uh, through the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail, and then coming over across through okay. Cambodia and Laos. All right, Don. Oh, um, Bob, back after France withdrew from. Vietnam in '54. The After and the country. Just let me finish my yeah, question, yeah, please. Okay. Uh, the country was partitioned, and, and it was supposed. At first, it was supposed to be a temporary partition. And this is a question, okay? Uh, and uh, so that the communists under Ho Chi Minh held the north in Han Hanoi, in the northern part of the country, mm -hmm. and and you had the government of No Dien Diem in uh, in Saigon in the south. Now. There were, by 1956, supposed to be a, an election for the whole country to, to elect a government that would, for a united Vietnam. Now, the CIA did a study and estimated that about 80% of the voters in the election uh, would have voted for, um, for the government of Ho Chi Minh. Mm -hmm. and, and so they recommended that this election never be held, That's which it was right. not. That's right. No and right. now, what, what's, your, uh, what's your take on that? Well, that's because, um, you know, more or less would have been a rigged election when you have, you know, right. Oh, no, 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 this was based on, wait, wait, wait hold, it, hold it, hold it, hold it, this was, this was based on the actual public opinion. Uh, it wasn't based on, it wasn't, the, the, the CIA study was based on public yes. opinion of the, of the actual Viet oh, the people serious. who were eligible to vote in Vietnam, the actual voters. <laughs> They want that Uncle O. Okay, go on. Well, okay. Um, like I said, they you know the election was did not go on because you know we knew it would have been uh, it would have been a victory for Ho Chi Minh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, and I don't yeah. think it would have been a entirely free election. I kind of I, I I haven't read your that particular thing you're talking about this public yeah, study. Yeah. I don't I don't remember that, but I remember reading about the the election and they thought that. 
it would have meant more or less a, a fixed type of uh, thing where where it would have been thrown to Ho Chi Minh. You know, all the you know he had his people in place to, to make sure that it was going to go that way, all that. So it wouldn't have been a necessarily a free and fair. Uh, type of election. Had some Let's go to rebuttals, yeah. Brown. <laughs> okay, Brown, it's time for uh, rebuttals. So, yes. The president, there was not even a link. We have a question here over here. Yeah, I want to know, do you know who the uh, two rubber industries that were major in Vietnam during the war? Who controlled the rubber? Who controlled the rubber in Vietnam? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, is actually it was Goodyear and Michelin. I believe and, Michelin is in And we actually have a friend who's a Vietnam vet who was told that they could not hmm? do any fire. No, no Americans could fire upon the land that Michelin and, and Goodyear owned. But the Vietnam could, could fire back at them. But they could not go into their land. Hmm, that's everything. I didn't, uh, didn't read that. I did look at uh, some of the uh, some of the natural resources and exports and things that, that Vietnam's doing, and they're about the fifth or seventh largest rubber exporter and about the fifth or seventh largest tin exporter. Right? Rubber tin, one's five and one's seven. I can't remember, uh, but they're fairly substantial exports. Uh, they're a big rice exporter, and uh, they actually. Uh, Oil is kind of weird. They actually export export some oil. I got, but they actually, but they import more than they export. So I'm thinking they're exporting some crappy oil and importing some good oil, some good usable oil. Or probably exporting some crappy oil that needs a lot of heavy refining or refining or something like that. And uh, now they're recently now exporting uh, some electronics, you know, computer stuff. Uh, of course, they're exporting garments. Um, Sneakers. Some oh sh uh, sh mm. shoe wear. They actually yeah. import uh, materials to make shoes, and they export sh uh, shoe wear. Shoes footwear, yeah. and uh, uh, the, uh, lots of other things. Now they're starting to get like the uh, Shenzhen Industrial Zone. I did see. A, uh, I was at Kohl's what one day, and I, I I did see. I didn't buy it, but I did see. I looked. At, I was looking at a, a shirt that caught my eye. And I looked at the label. I noticed it was made in Vietnam at Kohl's. Yeah. I said this hat was made. Yeah. Very Oh, okay. All right, let's uh, some more uh, some comments on the on the economic state of Vietnam now. Touch on the fact that some reforms. But what does your author hmm? tell you? And what's your opinion on what's the state of their economy? Oh uh, well, they since they're uh, kind of uh, you know dependent on on exports to basically they export to us, they export to China, they export to Japan. And South Korea, uh, I think maybe Taiwan might have been in there because of the because of the, the global crisis. I think demand is slackened in those all those areas. So so their their exports are down a tad, but uh, but overall in the last few years uh, their economy economy had been growing about seven percent a year. Uh, so they're actually you know the, the market reforms are, are are helping. When did these market reforms come? come well, about five years ago. They just, uh, they just started this stuff about five years ago. Okay. And uh, okay. Uh, start the rebuttals, Brom. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, let's go. Let's let's go. Start let's the go. rebuttals. I got, I got this one. Let's say one more for Mike Foley. All right, Mike, Mike Foley. Hurry up. Who is this country's most famous I'm Vietnam old veteran? Old Who's this country's most famous Vietnam veteran? Most Bob famous, Bennett. most well known, whatever it was. Most famous Vietnam veteran. Wow. Uh, I would oh. say that's probably have to Bruce be. Bruce Springsteen. That probably have to be, uh, yeah. I would say, between Colin Powell and no. Kerry. Jane Fonda. Oh, Jane Fonda. <laughs> <laughs> and she fought for the enemy. Yep, I'm not fond of Jane. That's what I'm right. right. well, Let's thank Bob. Let's go. Hey. Yeah. 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 We've got some other picks on comments. I want to mention that I, I, you know, I, I get a lot of criticism from this. Before, whenever I bring up something, you know, more or less pro-war, people go, well, you, you're not a veteran. You're a, you know, you're a chicken hawk or whatever. You want everybody else to fight, yeah, you, right fight yourself and all that. Well, the uh, sort of the story behind that is, that uh, my mom's cousin, uh, Royce, his name is Royce Meyer, 
was in World War II. He was a pilot, and he was killed in uh, Italy in 1943. And uh, you know, these are all uh, you know. My family is from Wisconsin, from the kind of Eau, Eau Claire area, Eau Claire, Plum City, Osseo. And uh, you know, these are more or less small towns back then. And uh, everybody knew everybody else. Everybody was pretty close, and that really had a, a large effect on. Uh, you know, my, my mother, my, my aunt, matter of fact, my aunt named her son Royce after Royce that was killed in the war. And that's who, uh, if, you, if you're ever in Munster, Indiana on Calumet Avenue, uh, sort of just over the Illinois border, you'll see, if you see Royce photography, that's my cousin Royce Shinar. He's named after my mom's cousin Royce who was killed in, in the war. So my mother, of course, you know, I, had a, I got a lot of, uh, you know, lecturing from her about not joining the service, but I did want to go in. The Marines actually, we talk about being probably kind of nutty, but uh, uh, again, I had another, I had a couple, I had an uncle who was in, uh, also in World War II, who came out alive and was a Marine, and I had uh, two, an uncle who was in Korea as a Marine, so again, I kind of felt this gravitation towards the Marines. And, by the way, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the, they don't draft people into the Marines, right? No, no they, they do. do. They, they do. do. They yes, they did some They do. Okay. They do. So, uh, anyway, because of that, I mean, it's really, uh, it's always been a soft spot in my family because of Royce being killed. So, uh, that's sort of, I didn't want to really hurt my mother. I was the only child, so I ended up not going, ended up going into college. But uh, my best friend from, well, two of my best friends, actually, went in. One went to the Marines and retired, and uh, when went to the Air Force. And, uh, was, you know, he, so this was after the Vietnam War, so didn't face any hostilities he came out alive. Then he was killed on his motorcycle here in the United States. Don't feel bad. George Bush didn't go either. <laughs> yeah, so. William Jefferson Clinton didn't go either. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah. You, 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 you didn't change. So, so a lot of those guys don't. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I, but I certainly have a, a lot of respect and admiration for, uh, for everybody who did go. Because, you know, even if you're, um, even in a non-combat role, I mean, you're, you're still putting your, you know, life in danger. A lot of these guys can get killed. It's uh, some things like, you know, accidents and things that happen, and, uh, you know, during the course of their work. It's a lot of dangerous work with dangerous equipment, and things, uh, things happen. So, uh, so anyway, my hat is off to uh, all of them. Thank you very much. I want to know how many people have remarks to make. Uh, 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 for the rest of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, twenty minutes each. Uh, well, that's a good start. Five minutes each. Okay. Be up to five minutes. Yeah. Should everyone get uh, the same amount of time? That's kind of communist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to be fair and all that. His name is Red Charlie. Red Charlie. I want to be a landowner. <laughs> <laughs> Argentina, and I started working in this company, and when I was called by the draft, the owner of the company said, don't go, uh, you have to wait for another letter. When I received that other letter, it said that I was exempt from, from so they, they put a, some kind of petition to the government that I was necessary for the industry, and so I was uh, prevented from going to the war. I didn't even know what was going on. I was totally unaware. I couldn't speak English at the time. So I was spared on that uh, horrible, I think, experience. 
uh, I think that all the wars uh, that we have gone into in the past or that we may go in the future are uh, totally brutal and, and unnecessary and destructive. They uh, waste uh, resources, human knowledge, and, and everything else. So why do we keep uh, on this on this course? I, I don't understand. Um, we, we have uh, very, very, very important problems coming up very soon. Uh, we are confronted with the depletion of the fossil fuels. This is a, uh, a known thing that uh, when we started extracting oil at the beginning, uh, we got one barrel of oil. We have 100 barrels of oil for each barrel of oil of energy that we use. Today, we get two and a half barrels of oil for each barrel of oil that we uh, utilize to extract that two and a half barrels. So this is becoming to the point that when you use one barrel of oil of energy to extract one barrel of oil of energy, we don't have any more petroleum available. Or or, or or things like that. I get distracted when people keep their own conversations somewhere. I, I, I don't know why, but I get very distracted about that. Um, I mentioned in, in my, my uh, comments before that we are really uh, destroying the foundations of life on the earth. The, the way that we treat in the sea is not different than what we are treating the land and so on. Uh, we are being poisoned on the food that we eat because it's contaminated with all these chemicals that they are added to make it more profitable to make the foods that we eat. And uh, also we are being contaminated with radiation all over the world. Uh, we are in the brink of a very big disaster, and that is that Fukushima accident has not ended. The Fukushima accident, uh, it is pending. There is uh, about a hundred times amount, more amount of radiation in this pool that is in danger of falling any time on the, on the reactor number four that was in the whole accident with the meltdown of the reactors. Now, this is pending. This is there. Will it happen? Will it not happen? But so far, the government of Japan or, or engineers and scientists, they don't know how to prevent that from eventually happening. Uh, the reality is that already, uh, United States in the West Coast was heavily contaminated with cesium-137 in the form of particles that they were so abundant that every human being on California was breathing two particles of these radioactive particles a day. So if you if you take in consideration that these particles will definitely, if they get large in the body, whether in the lungs or some other part of the digestive system, they will eventually create or produce a cancer. Uh, so in a few years, maybe 10, something about years, we will see a spike in cancers going on in that area where people were breathing these particles. But this is not the only time, the only place in Rocky Flats. Um, we, we spread plutonium all over the place, and in order to cover it, we build developing uh, housing in the area and, and, and ignore the fact that uh, the, the area was heavily contaminated with plutonium. So we have big problems to deal with, and, and hopefully, and I have to say that uh, I, I like uh, the presentation. I was very afraid that uh, uh, our friend here was going to be uh, so extreme, but he was very good at presenting what, what he saw at the board, so I was surprised.
Andy Anderson. Five minutes. Five minutes. I brought my uh, my old uniform. I haven't, I haven't put it on in 42 years. I got out of the Army in 1970, more or less. It's a little tight. I put on a few pounds, but I, I thought maybe it would uh, give me some inspiration of thinking back to what it was like being in Vietnam for two years. And, um, I'd like to thank Bob for. Let me have that white butter. I'd like to thank Bob for confirming uh, my thesis that I've given 10 talks here on over the last few years that Americans generally believe things that are not true because they're listening to the mainstream media. And um, I, I don't know if I said it before, I just got this new book this week, it's called Who Owns the World? And it absolutely confirms Bob's thesis <laughs> about land ownership. Land ownership uh, you know, is the key to wealth all over the world. And uh, where people don't own any land, they're a lot poorer. So, uh, you know, Bob has given several talks on uh, rent, land, uh, and how wealth accumulates. And he's been right on the money on that subject all these years. On tonight's subject, in Vietnam, I think Bob succumbed to what I call the 10,000 to 1 ratio. And in America, we get 10,000 minutes of cribs, that's criminally insane bullshit, for, <laughs> for every, every, we get one minute of truth versus 10,000 minutes of cribs. That's cribs, criminally insane bullshit. <laughs> And that's, that's what the media puts out in America. So you, you might have a scrap of truth show up on the air sometimes, but it's drowned out by 10,000 minutes of Rush Limbaugh. The man's a genius. He's the highest paid intellectual prostitute on the planet. He shapes and molds public opinion. And so you can live in America for years and thinking like uh, number four here, the spraying was low concentration of Agent Orange, and yeah, it wasn't yeah. really of uh, much of a problem because they didn't go. The troops were told they would they could be safe when they went in there. The troops were stonewalled for almost 30 years on the healthful disaster of Agent Orange. Hundreds of thousands of troops are struggling with cancer, leukemia, all kinds of things from that. That's just one of the pieces of the major disaster of Vietnam. General Smedley Butler wrote a book in 1935. Brigadier General Smedley Butter, Butler wrote this book called War is a Racket. I highly recommend it to anybody that wants to understand that uh, our politicians don't take us into war. The billionaires that make money off of war and the billionaires that own and operate and rent and own our politicians, they're the ones that decide when we need a war every now and then to make huge war profits. That's what Vietnam was all about. I was there for two years, and I remember uh, I, I, my job was working on helicopter gunships, re repairing uh, radios. So we'd be listening, we'd be in the van at night with our headset on, we'd be listening to the, the choppers talking to each other, and when one, there was one night when our base was being fired upon, and they could see the choppers got up before the rockets hit the base, and so they're flying around, and it, it's dark, it's about midnight, and they can see the flashes of where these, uh, where the Viet Cong are firing rockets into our base. And um, one of the pilots said, permission to fire, permission to fire, permission denied. Our, our pilots could not get permission to fire on the enemies that were firing rockets into the base. And so the next day, I tracked down the, the pilot and the crew chief, I said, you know, what the hell was going on? How come you couldn't get uh, permission to fire? He said, well, we have a quota. We can't just fire on the enemy wherever we see them if, if we, because we know where they are and we can see them. If we were just firing on the enemy wherever they were fighting at us, the war would be over quick. We, got a, we have a quota every day, and then we come back to the barracks and have beer. And they stretch it out for years. It was an economic operation to make billions and billions of dollars for the people that make hardware for the war. And, and uh, you know, I, I'm a first person witness. I was there. I didn't hear that second hand or read in some kind of book. 
we two thirds were volunteers. You're absolutely right. Two two thirds of the people volunteered for the Vietnam War. We volunteered in order to get some. That can't be five minutes. It's five minutes already. Oh, geez. Okay, I'll, I'll finish quick. Give me maybe thirty seconds. We volunteered to avoid getting drafted. All the people you know, there, there, there was a tremendous need to avoid getting drafted. The popularity, the one thing, the Vietnam popularity waned because thousands of veterans come back as teachers. They teach the population after they, the eyewitnesses, the people that come back without an arm or a leg or anything else, they fan out into the public and they become first person teachers to educate a public about what war is like. The Vietnam War wound down pretty quick when a couple hundred thousand were back in America teaching the general population what was really going on over there. And our, our soldiers were being told, oh, it's a free fire zone, just shoot anything that moves. And many people came back with psychological problems because they knew they were just shooting in the villages, killing women and children all over the place. Kill ratio is 20 to 1, okay? So, uh, talking about the benefits of the Vietnam War is kind of like talking about the benefits that were given to us by the pedophile priests and the Catholic <laughs> Okay, Andy, thanks for that rebuttal. I'll try to make mine short. Uh, Bob mentioned enclaves, and I cringed when that happened because that made me realize that I was stupid enough to back the Vietnam War at that in the early part. I can't, I can't believe how dopey I was to do that. Uh, but I had the idea, oh, we ought to go into enclaves. I'm glad we did. We might still be there. Uh, I hate to confess that, but I was a Catholic till I was 21. And something about conscience. I still got that idea that you should admit to your mistakes. Uh, who, uh, no, I would that. suggest uh, the uh, March of Folly by Barbara Tuckman if you want to re read a, a short, interesting part on the Vietnam War. As Andy said, well, who, who benefited? Well, it certainly wasn't the American people. We lost the war. Then we had to pay for the damn thing. Don't tell me the veterans won anything. Geez, what a lousy way to get a college education. Or they die. So uh, the only ones who won, as far as I can tell, is American business. I think they did pretty well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I thought it was a very good talk. Uh, Bob took a very controversial subject and, uh, and, and pulled a lot out of it. Uh, about, the, the, about the only thing I'll agree with you on, Bob, uh, about those myths, the genocide of the blacks, the rubber plantations, the oil shipping, offshore drilling, and new Pentagon weapons, those were all, they are all myths. Uh, I read enough to know uh, the real reason was American involvement was there to basically stop uh, the spread of that, that dirty red communists from coming on down to the south. Uh, you mentioned, Bob, POWMIAs are non-existent. There was a very good radio article back in 1989 on WLS uh, when WLS actually was a very good talk show station. Stacy Taylor uh, it was interviewing General Bo Greitz and basically he took a covert operation uh, in 87 commissioned uh, by the Pentagon and some joint chiefs to put, uh, I really wanted to know, where are POW MIAs in Southeast Asia? They dropped them down there, they spent a couple months in certain camps, marching around in Laos, Cambodia, and what they basically found was uh, these prisoner of war camps were pretty much uh, put away, gone, but they realized that the, the couple hundred POW MIAs were pretty much integrated into society uh, in Laos, Cambodia, and possibly China. So we, we do have people that, I are, that are missing in action. Just, they just don't have a life here in America. They're pretty much 
uh, Gone and other civil uh, civilizations there in, the, in, that, in, in that area. And then Agent Orange. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Agent Orange doesn't dis that it, Agent Orange dissipates in sunlight. Basically, Agent Orange, Bob, there, there is no really permissible exposure level to it. I do environmental work. I was trained to do that in the Navy as well. Um, Agent Orange, everyone, is DDT. DDT. Uh, it kills everything. I mean, and it's in the soil for a minimum of uh, probably 30 to 40 years. Well, Agent Orange is not a very good thing for anybody to be exposed. And then Eisenhower referred to our, uh, our allies down there, Dim and his brother, as uh, king and brother. So it tells you a little bit what, what Eisenhower thought about the regime down there. Pretty much we were failed to go when we went. I mean, America really didn't understand the Oriental mindset. They didn't realize the Confucian element when involved with uh, the Vietnam, because the Vietnamese in the South were Catholics. I, I mean, we were Buddhists, and uh, Dim and his brother, uh, they were Catholic. Uh, and pretty much the peasants, they, they had no interest in politics, taxes, or armies. Uh, they wanted to continue their ancestral heritage and farm their land in peace. They viewed the American army as what Andy says, as just another deadly force that threatened their existence. That's what the American army was. Combat troops were sent for our own national interests in the, in the judgment of what we have as so-called leaders that required our presence there and for no other reason. <coughs> and then lastly, uh, when I was reading and doing a lot of research on this, this uh, subject, uh, I read an article, actually it was out of a book, uh, from the, the Voices of Vietnam, Charlene Edwards. They found on uh, Du Luc, uh, his diary, and uh, he wrote, leaving temporary the beloved North to return to my native south to liberate my compatriots from the yoke of misery imposed by my dim, U.S. dim. Now my life is full of hardship, but in my heart I keep loyal to the party and to the people. I am proud and happy. I remember reading something about Ho Chi Minh. He said even if we lost ten people to one American, he said, we will fight the Americans 10, 20, 40 years. We didn't get it. Our, our so-called leadership didn't get it. If they looked upon this Vietnam War, if they, if they looked upon our establishment of our own nation, when the British were here, we were a superior fighting force. We would never engage them in a full-out frontal attack. We would just whittle away at them, and that's exactly what Ho Chi Minh had to train the North, his North regular North Vietnamese soldiers, his VC, which were Vietnam communists, and people that were sympathetic to the movement in the South. They wanted the land, they wanted, it got the Chinese out, they got the French out, and eventually they were going to get the Americans out. With that said, I'm finished. Thank you. I'm Michael Foley. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, the United States of America was fighting North Vietnam and the commies, the dirty, stinking, pink, oh, godless commies. Yeah. 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 And we were trying to help the freedom and democracy loving people of South Vietnam. Right. I believe that's a flat out lie. <clears throat> I believe our ally in the Vietnam War for the whole time was North Vietnam. The people who run this country. I don't know if there's just 10 or 20 guys in Washington or New York from this country, or maybe it really is 300 million American people who run this country, but whoever runs this country, they sent CIA murderers to South Vietnam to murder the president of South Vietnam, who was supposed to be our ally, and whoever runs this country sent 3 million men over the course of 16, million, 16 years to kill people in South yeah. Vietnam, and we did send people to bomb North Vietnam, various places, but we killed people in South Vietnam for 16 years, and we left 
And the dirty, stinging pinko godless commies of North Vietnam just drove right down south to South Vietnam and took it over like they wanted. We did everything we could to fight a war for 16 years. And at the end of the 16 years, our supposed enemy got exactly what they wanted and said they were victorious. We helped them occupy South Vietnam. We helped them <coughs> enslave and subjugate and dominate and kill the people of South Vietnam. That is what happened. I don't believe the people of this country spent billions and billions of dollars and sent three million people somewhere over a period of 16 years and at the end of it think, gee, that ain't really quite what we wanted to do. Maybe we should have thought a little bit about it. The people of this country, whoever runs this country, does not F things up day and night for 16 years. The people who run this country do exactly what they want to do for 16 years. And at the end of 16 years, North Vietnam took over South Vietnam with our help, assistance, whatever you want to call it. Now I asked a stupid question about who's this country's most famous Vietnam veteran. It is Jane Fonda. Jane Fonda fought a war. She went to North Vietnam. She entered the North Vietnamese Army. She was assigned to an anti-aircraft battery where she participated in helping to shoot down American planes with American soldiers in these planes. And she came back to this country and she wasn't prosecuted for not even a parking ticket. She was rewarded. She was one of the most famous women in this country. She's one of the richest women in this country. She's one of the most popular women in this country. And supposedly she fought a war against this country. Remember this guy, that the Taliban, the American Taliban, the guy's name was John Walker. He was grabbed in Afghanistan or Iraq someplace. The newspapers went friggin' crazy screaming about this guy. The American traitor, the American, whatever you call him. He was some poor dope ass kid. He was involved in some kind of Taliban or Al Qaeda unit or something. Some dope ass kid with a rifle. He was crucified. He was sold down the river by his own lawyers. I'm not saying the guy did a good thing, but how does that compare to Jane Fonda? It doesn't. Who was the enemy soldier? fighting against American troops, and who, she did everything but get medals when she came back. Okay. I'm also a person who believes that one of the missions of the Vietnam War was to get black men killed and to get the sons of low-income white people killed, because again, that's what happened for 16 years. The people of this country, or whoever runs this country, did it for 16 years straight. They sent black, young black men who were educated. They didn't get a bunch of fucking, excuse me, they didn't get a bunch of armed robbers or rapists out of jail. They said, you're a black guy, you're a rapist. You've been sent for 25 years, you go to Vietnam and get killed. They didn't do that. They found young black guys who were high school graduates or in college, and they found young white guys, they were from low-income families, but most of them had high school diplomas or were in college, and they were sent for 16 straight years to Vietnam to get killed. That's what happened. Don't believe what these idiot politicians tell us. All right, Look well, what happened. All right Mike. All right. You're done. Okay. You're done. Oh, you You're done. Listen to the 30 seconds. There are a lot of people from Vietnam in this country. They were people that believed in freedom and liberty. They were fighting a war for their own country. They appreciated help that they thought they were getting from the Americans. A lot of them came to this country. And there are still Vietnamese people in this country who go to California every year and protest against the current government in Vietnam. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you get an A for coming in here and giving us the most mm -hmm. provocative uh, topic of discussion here in weeks. Uh, you know, for that, uh, you're to be commended. But you flunk miserably in military tactics and strategy and geopolitics. <laughs> yes, but there were many theories 
advance tonight regarding our reasons for going into Vietnam. Some of them were actually plausible. <laughs> but but the, one, the one that totally amazes me is that we went into Vietnam solely because we had to show our putative allies that we would stand and fight wherever the communist bear arose. Now, any second lieutenant knows you do not let the enemy pick the battlefield. You pick the battlefield. You decide where you will fight, how you will fight, and under what terms. The only people who fall into that kind of trap are politicians, not professional military people. And as a matter of fact, it's a matter of record that before we fully committed to Vietnam, after the Gulf of Tonkin debacle, uh, before we fully committed to Vietnam, there were a number of starry voices raised against our getting involved. One of them was a retired military commander of some note, perhaps you've heard of him, Douglas MacArthur. Uh, MacArthur is the one who said anyone who gets himself involved in a jungle war in Southeast Asia needs his head examined. It was an opinion he never deviated from because in 1964, in April 1964, when he was dying at Walter Reed Hospital, the President of the United States came to pay him a courtesy visit, Lyndon Johnson, and MacArthur's last plea to the President was Mr. President, get out of Vietnam. It's not too late. But Johnson didn't because Johnson felt that we had to show the world that we would fight and prevail in that part of the world. Now, you don't have to be a genius to know if you're going to pick a fight, you have to pick a fight that you know that you can win. And you have to pick a fight in a place that you can win. I'm not an expert in Asian history, but I do know this much. Twice the Chinese had attempted to subjugate Vietnam um, during our Middle Ages, actually. Uh, then the French came in the 19th century. And yes, the French ruled what was then known as Annam and Tonkin, uh, the provinces, uh, for, from 1880 until 1954. And the French fell into exactly the same trap that Bob recommended, and that is having the Allied forces, the American forces, because we weren't the only ones that were there, uh, having these forces enter into fortified communities, hold that, and prevent the enemy from keeping control of the rest of the country. That's not how it works. Uh, the French learned that at a place called Dien Dien Phu. Um, in the 1890s, the Spanish learned precisely that when they set up the encomiendas in Cuba during the Spanish-American War and uh, put themselves under siege when they need not have been. Uh, you don't learn from the lessons of history. You're going to repeat them, as Santa Yana said. And this gets very, very costly. Now, to even suggest that our presence in Vietnam resulted in some kind of a victory, anyone who was watching TV in that last week of April when Saigon was falling, and it was televised live, you got to see a country fall live. And these people, Americans and others, were packing their bags, rushing for helicopters, that's not the scenes of victory. That's the scene of flight. It was the first time I had ever seen on live TV American troops fleeing for their lives. This is not a victory. It's not their disgrace. The problem was not created by them. The problem was created by the politicians who failed to listen to the people who knew best how to fight a war. The military. All right, get out of here. All right, you're done. I'm done. Oh.
But listen to the generals. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Thank you for your research and some uh, interesting facts and figures that I didn't know that you presented. Uh, I agree with a lot of things that you said, but I think there's some some things that uh, I, you left out. One of the points which you made tonight, and I don't know if this got across to the crowd, that is most of the Vietnam War was not against the group of, of local uh, uh, militia type uh, uh, guerrillas, uh, the VC. The VC was formed, or the, the National Liberation Front was formed in 1960 in answer to Diem's uh, abuses, uh, Diem, the fellow that we put in. Uh, and they were powerful for a number of years. They were effective. But the, the largest force that we were fighting were, was the uh, NVA, the, the uh, North Vietnamese Army. We were a regular army. Uh, well equipped, well trained, etc. It was not a bunch of guerrillas that we were fighting for most of the war. That's one good point that you made. However, I disagree with you on the business of winning uh, the Vietnamese War. I think that it's pretty clear that we lost. Uh, 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 okay, uh, just made, made the point on that. Pat Butler just made the point on that. Uh, being lifted off the roof on a helicopter is not exactly a sign of victory. But I'll go to what Eisenhower said. Eisenhower was asked shortly after World War II if we'd won World War II. His response was, if 50 years from now, Japan and Germany are prosperous democracies, we won. Otherwise, we lost. Well, in fact, Japan and Germany were prosperous democracies, still are, despite the economic problems of the world. So we can say by that standard we won World War II. By that standard we definitely lost Vietnam because during the time when the Asian Tigers were going crazy, Vietnam was lagging behind. Just the, these new reforms that I'm not that familiar with uh, that came in recently seem to be helping, but they were the they were the basket case economy. I mean, they weren't as bad as Bangladesh, perhaps, but they were, other than that, they were probably the basket case economy uh, of Asia. So in a sense, we sentenced them to, to terrible economic times by turning the country back over to the communists uh, when we left. My basic contention is the Vietnam War was good foreign policy and good political policy initially. Not necessarily well executed foreign policy. A lot of things we did wrong. We could talk for hours on the <coughs> mistakes we made, the people we supported, et cetera, et cetera. But we, it was the Cold War. I can't believe how many people here, even with gray hair, seem to have forgotten the Cold War, seem, seem to have forgotten the fact that we really were not sure at that time uh, who was going to prevail. Uh, we were scared. The Russians had a lot of advantages. Uh, they had more nuclear weapons than we did. They had. Uh, better ways to deliver them. They got into space before we did, and uh, we were concerned. And so this, yes, uh, Vietnam was a proxy war, as was the, the Russian uh, incursion into Afghanistan Stan was a proxy war. But we did not know at that time, and this is why uh, we had to go into Vietnam, at least initially. Then later, it became bad political policy. Why? Because it became unpopular. Well, something is good foreign policy or public policy and bad political policy, what happens? It goes away because political policy always wins. That's what happened in Vietnam, why we uh, ended up withdrawing from Vietnam. Uh, a few numbers here. There were uh, three million men that were sent to Vietnam during the war. Uh, Andy and a couple of other people made that point. There were nine million men who served in the military during the Vietnam War, so only one-third of them went over. There were 27 million men who were military age, so it was not a huge number, uh, a huge percentage of people that did in fact serve. And somebody else made the point, uh, it sounds funny, but volunteering to avoid the draft. People generally didn't uh, uh, volunteer for Vietnam. There were a large number of people who did, but the vast majority did not. They were in the military, they were sent. Okay, and many people avoided the military because of Vietnam, and there were people who avoided Vietnam who were in the military. I know several who, who found ways uh, to do that. But uh, in, in, that, uh, in that day, uh, serving in the military was one of the things we all, as growing up, had to consider if we were male. Uh, it was a coming of age, rite of passage, etc. You, 
you were going to plan your life, one of the things that you had to deal with was serving in the military. And our concepts of citizenship and our concepts of, of manhood itself uh, changed radically during the Vietnam era. Uh, maybe for the better, maybe not. That's, uh, that's something that uh, perhaps uh, only time will tell. Okay, thank you. Just a microphone here. Uh, all right. Uh, you know, some of you may look at my T-shirt and think that, that that I'm coming to this meeting with some kind of a anti-war bias or something like that, just because of the, just because of the shirt I wear. Yeah, well, right. all right. Uh, you know, Bob. Uh, oh, is my time up? Uh, Bob, you know, you know, I just want to say, you know, Bob. Okay, yeah, Bob. Bob, but sort of at, earlier in his presentation, he kind of attacked. He actually. It sort of went after the anti-war crowd, and, and in particular, he attacked Brad Little by name. You know, uh, who happens to be uh, he ha Brad happens to be my landlord and, and, and a real good friend of mine. So, um, so I, uh, I I I hope I may be forgiven if I took that a little bit personally. Um, but in any case, I think you know one. I don't you know, One may not agree with Brad's politics. I don't agree with all of Brad's views on the issues myself. But I don't think you could ever question his integrity. Brad really believes in what he's doing. He is not a communist pawn of the Kremlin. He, uh, you know, he really opposes war. He believes that he believes that peace is, is preferable to war. He believes that uh, he believes it's better to, go, to not go around uh, murdering millions of people all the time. Um, I don't really uh, see that as a no, no, no. I, I don't particularly even see that as a very radical position. But uh, now. Uh, a lot of people have been talking about the Vietnam War. I think it is appropriate to place it in the larger context of Southeast Asia, which Bob did a little bit in when talking about the Philippines and Indonesia. Um, and people talk about why, you know, uh, I would argue, let's put aside the anti-war argument of Brad and the other, the, the peaceniks for a moment, and let's look at it from the, the viewpoint of the Cold War. We're engaged in a Cold War with the Soviets, a war for, as Bob put it, for world domination. I would argue that even on that basis, that number one, that the Vietnam War was a total waste of time, and that number two, it was unwinnable from the very beginning. And let me tell you, um, if you look at the larger context of Southeast Asia, there actually have been cases of communist insurgents who ultimately wound up getting defeated. Uh, there were communist insurgents in Indonesia, and there were also communist insurgents in the Philippines. Actually, every country in Southeast Asia, except for the city-state of Singapore, had communist insurgents during the, during the early stages of the Cold War. Um, and the only, the reason why they were unbeatable in Vietnam is not because they were more determined than the guys in the other countries. It was because, uh, as Bob pointed out, they had the backing of China. You couldn't, once China had already gone communist, well, China is such a big country with such a huge population that we could not get into a war with them and win. And once, from 1964 onward, they were nuclear armed. And so because of, so because of this, we did, as Bob pointed out, we didn't dare to attack North Vietnam because if we did, Yes, Bob is right about that. It would have triggered a war with China, and that would have led to, you know what, World War III. So, so that meant that as long as North Vietnam remained an independent country, supplying weapons to the Viet Cong in South Vietnam, they could go on doing that forever. We couldn't attack North Vietnam without we risking World War III. This. We couldn't, well, we did bomb, but we couldn't invade North Vietnam, and we sure as heck, oh, and we sure yeah, as heck couldn't bomb, here. and we sure as heck couldn't bomb China. So, so basically, uh, on the other hand, and, and they had this land, and see, North Vietnam has a land border with South Vietnam, so they could keep bringing the supplies in. Now, the Philippines, and we had a counterinsurgency war in the Philippines against Philippine guerrillas in the 1900s, very similar to Vietnam, uh, and, and the U.S. actually won it. And the reason is because the Philippines are islands, and the rebels could be isolated, and all shipments of arms to them could be cut off. That was impossible in the case of Vietnam. And, uh, and, and now, anyone with half a brain could see ahead of time that that's how it was going to turn out, as I think um, some, people, you know, some generals did see. And, that is, uh, and that's why we lost the war in Vietnam. 
And all right, all right, all right. Well, hey, my, my well, five minutes aren't up yet. We but gotta just, cut it back, though. We're gonna run okay, out of time. Okay, well, hang on a yeah. second. I got, I, I deserve my five minutes as much as anybody Come else, on. and I'm not gonna you, talk to you, Charlie. I'm gonna. Sir, okay, sir, all right. Analytics. I just want to say one other thing, Bob. One area where Bob kind of gets it wrong is he seems to think that fighting communism is the same thing as promoting democracy. But a lot of t times in, during the Cold War, the United States actually put down democracy in the name of fighting communism. I mean, one example is the one I've cited, in, in specifically in the case of Vietnam, canceling the elections. And then you never did have free elections either in the North or the South. Another example would be, for example, Chile, where a, an elected socialist government was overthrown by the American CIA and, and replaced with uh, a dictator, uh, all in the name of fighting communism. That also happened in Guatemala, and it also happened in, in that was 1954, and also in, uh, right, Brazil in 64, and also in Iran in 53, and there have been other times as well. So finally, Pat Butler says, listen to the generals. Well, there was one general from that era, an Air Force general, that I'm glad a politician didn't listen to, and that was General Curtis LeMay, because during the Cuban Missile Crisis, Curtis LeMay was saying, fuck it, let's just go nuke those Russians. I was afraid somebody was going to bring him up. OK, and I think with that, I'll play. <laughs> Hey, we're going to have to cut it down. We're not going to have time. Um, get, it's got to go to three minutes. Yeah, we got to go. You don't have to look behind you. Well, Charlie, you're slowing it down. Oh, come on, Don. You use bullshit on analytics. I'm going to tell you some of the May stories sometimes. It's crazy. Four minutes. Okay. Uh, I didn't come to uh, attack the speaker, Bob. I come to praise it. And I'll tell you why. When Bob first started to come to College Complex, he was somewhat a liberal. <laughs> Bob, hold it now. And why I like Bob, not only as an individual, a decent man, intelligent, but why I like Bob, ever since I've known him, you know, when he used words like liberal, uh, Charles Red. Uh, conservative, he did, he never, uh, as I, since I know him, explained what a liberal was, uh, explained what a communist is, uh, explained what a conservative is, but he let us know that he's a conservative. Now, these are just words, so now I'm not going to stand here and try to critique him in a negative way, but I got to make a couple compliments about the tower, for <coughs> instance, why we was in Vietnam. Well, I can say some of the things that he denied that I believe why we was there. Now, I read 1984 in Alwal, Alwell, he wrote in 49 that part of Wall was economic. Most of it was economic. And we were able to fight one another. And when I say one another, China, United States, Russia, United States, that's bullshit, Alwell said. What we gonna do is pick out some little country here and there and fight theirs, okay? Now, somebody said, well, that was all well, that was fiction. I said, it was fiction, but I was a living individual and I saw in his fiction a whole lot of truth. Now, since I'm a detective, was a detective, I know the hierarchy of evidence. And the mama said, my son was with me. Her testimony is less effective than a stranger that said, yeah, I saw him. Now, Orwell was fiction. Well, I tell you something. Eisenhower, the president of the United States, was not fiction. And he said, be aware of the industrial military complex. What are he talking about here? Ain't about we fighting to prove and show. He talking about people out there have an interest in war. And in the United States, if you got an interest, it's all about money. And then the next is power. So I have to say that, oh, and the other thing, and if that ain't enough, all will, as and now, where in the hell were you when the administration on the roof told all kinds of lies to get us into Iraq? So the official version is not going to be good enough for me. I got to have some more information. Now, if you want to deny, and, and he will do it, because I, I allowed Bob Matter to, to, to deny that Bush took, didn't tell a whole lot of lies, because 
he'll, he'll admit that two and two is five. He don't argue with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my first up encounter with the Vietnam War, up close and personal, was in the summer of 1966. I was first having a go around with the draft. And I seems like they couldn't open up a paper that summer without a report of U.S. troops getting bombed by their own planes. And I couldn't help wondering if that's what they're doing to their own troops. What are they doing to the Vietnamese? <coughs> now, uh, in our best tradition of pre-prepared rebuttals, and I suppose we're going to have more than usual tonight, But I'm glad I've got not only that book synopsis on the internet, but also Orwell's War is Peace, which describes a war very much like Vietnam, a war not fought to win anything. Its purpose is to dissipate human wealth. Okay. A hierarchical society, he said, can only be maintained by poverty and drudgery. And my interpretation of that is the capitalist union. The over dissipation of capital, so that the well, for one thing in any way, that the labor market will not be as lively as it as it could be. That's all I got really got anything against the labor union yet, except for part of the capitalist union. But uh, uh, a lot of things we can say about Vietnam. I refuse to go to Vietnam. I refuse to, to be drafted. Now I wanted to make a defense that is unconstitutional. I found out that the judge and his father owned bank stocks that had gone drastically up in value since the escalation. I tried to get him out of my case. Well, I had the case in a higher court. You should have warned for my arrest. And I was kind of had to make my social security for several years. It wasn't too much fun either. But, uh, We still have the draft to deal with. And it's, it's the same, the same, I contend it's unconstitutional, and the same sources of the Federalist Papers and uh, the debates on the Constitution, on the Bill of Rights, will also show that the draft is unconstitutional. They'll also show that present system of setting the National Guard outside the country is unconstitutional too. So an army is unconstitutional. Well, the army is uh, Article 1, Section 8 specifically gives Congress the power to raise and support armies. Yeah. When they said armies, they meant a paid professional oh, yeah. army. Uh, I saw a cartoon about 1965. And a religious paper, believe it or not. <coughs> so it's like, get out of Vietnam in 1965. Those are just my uh, Get out of the Philippines in 1975. All right, Phil. Uh, You're done. Get out of the podium. You're done. Get out of, you know what? Get out, yeah. And get out of, get out of, California in 1995. Thank you, Bill. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Lucy Zucas. I'm from Europe. Originally, I came to America when I was eight. 
a <coughs> long military uh, tradition in my family. Our father was a squadron commander in the Indian Air Force. Grandfather had been Minister of Defense. When he came to America, he became a janitor at the hospital where he died. Anyway, I was drafted upon graduation in college in uh, in uh, Vietnam in 1966. I was a foreign observer for mortar platoon, meaning I directed fire for mortars. Uh, the typical Viet Cong was a uh, teenage boy. And the reason I know that, I saw the bodies. The typical American uh, uh, soldier in my uh, platoon was somebody that was 18, 19. The reason I know their age was because we were, we were buddies. Uh, I have a poem here that uh, reflects two situations in Vietnam that uh, actually was there. Let me read it to you and then I'll be done. <clears throat> I entered through the unlocked door. Flames were moving on the ceiling like waves in the ocean. I saw children asleep, dreaming the same dream, sleeping. A strange silent platoon in time of heat. The jungle draws heat over them, hot and humid. Sunlight, symmetrical like the Furies, obliter obliterating thought and breath. They are tied in bundles, bent at acute angles, retied with force. Fifteen-year-old mm -hmm. boys lie live in plastic garbage bags, tied so tight they cannot urinate, alive but better dead. They lie in the sunlight, tortured asleep, they sleep in the name of freedom. They are the Viet Cong and we are saved. But today, uh, more than half the people in Vietnam are under 18. They call it the American War. They hold very little animosity since they don't remember it. Uh, I agree with many of the things that the dead gentleman said. We went there to uh, maintain our status, to increase our status worldwide. Uh, I was against it, but uh, I figured since I got drafted, I wanted to be drafted. I wanted to see the whole thing as a, as a uh, personal experience, which I did, and that changed me forever. Thank you. Yes, Rhonda Farron. Hello. Is there a, what happened to the microphone? It hasn't been on all night. You're kidding! <laughs> you just need to stay loud. Yeah, so speak loud. <laughs> speak up. Okay, because I, I guess there's an echo somewhere that I don't know about. Shit. Shit. <laughs> yeah. no, we don't need nothing. We don't need it. Right? I know your opinions about plastic Make it shit. quick. Okay, off topic, Frank, thank you for pointing out about Fukushima. Uh, it's an irony that California has done a huge anti-smoking campaign in order to reduce the number of people who had cancer and now it's going to go up based on Fukushima. Uh, okay, on topic, um, the most important thing I want to say is that I think this, this idea that there were a lot of volunteers, I don't know how many volunteers there were or not, but for sure volunteering often gave you a better position than if you were just drafted. I know somebody who went to volunteer, they went to um, uh, DLI, Defense Language Institute. There were lots of people who volunteered and then they went to Europe. They didn't go to Vietnam. So that's that's one thing. Uh, but I think there's a, a problem with saying, you didn't really give us any statistics. So you said, oh, well, um, there were more people who were shell-shocked in, in World War II, then in Vietnam, and you, know, you didn't even talk about Iraq. Uh, one thing that we know is we have more psychological <laughs> services, so no matter how bad it is, uh, if you've been through it and you go to, you know, you want to commit suicide when you come back, they now have programs, and you know, in one where they had a, help, a helpline, everybody in the state no longer is killing themselves. I mean, you know, it, it's, it, it's sort of unbelievable, but, um, you know, that you didn't give us statistics means, you know, are you talking about more in terms of percentage? Or are you talking about more people altogether? Or I, I find it difficult. Um, and then you said that uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave all these reasons and none of them were the reason. But the thing is, he gave a lot of reasons. So he was saying that all together those reasons were the, were the why we were in there, as opposed to what you were saying. Um, I think that's it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the statistics, in fact, 
Um, oh, I have also seen down. statistics about the Vietnam War, and the, the suicide rate was about the same. And, and it, when you compare the, the age groups, this war is not. There's there's something like the, the a number of suicides in the last three years have exceeded the number of, of U.S. casualties in the Iraq yeah. War. So um, we don't. Uh, we started out the Vietnam or the Vietnam War being really ignorant about it, both in the State Department as well as others. There's a lot of history about this that people are not aware of because we we, we learn our geography by war, but we don't learn anything else about it. Um, the uh, Red Scare and the McCarthy uh, thing um, caused a lot of people who were expert in China and Asia to be um, purged from the State Department. So we basically entered that moment with the real ignorance about what was going on there. The, um, you know, this U.S. interests um, in an area supporting our so-called friends and, and uh, opposing the Red Communist Scare has absolutely nothing to do with justice, has nothing to do with being fair or, um, or any kind of, of um, moral behavior in that part of the world. The, the French colony was incredibly oppressive and exploitative of the um, Vietnamese people there. Uh, when we when we went in there, we did the same thing, and um, we went and we went in there on a, on a lie. The Gulf of Tonkin resolution was based on a manufactured event. We went in violation of the Geneva Conventions. We, uh, we were not attacked by Vietnam, the same thing that we were not attacked by Iraq. We went in and totally fabricated um, basis. And we really, the, the, uh, the 58,000 people who died is really an underestimate because we didn't count the people that we sent in there before the uh, war was officially declared. Uh, because we did send in troops before that to, as support to the high uh, percentage kids with the, the hair lips and club pellets that came in and that was undoubtedly because of prenatal exposure to Agent Orange by their mothers. I personally knew a guy who was in the Marines and in, um, in Vietnam during the Tet Offensive. He personally shoved people out of helicopters and he personally tortured Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese prisoners. Um, so, um, you know, and, and he also personally, after the war, single handedly liberated the courthouse in Lima, Ohio from the Vietnam invaders. So he was a victim as much as um, a lot of other people. So I think it was an immoral and illegal war, as is many of the wars that we indulge in. It's fought for ulterior motives by people who have power so they can aggrandize themselves uh, with money and, um, and while people like my family who fought in every war that this country has been in since the Revolutionary War in 1776 because my people were farmers and workers and um, they were the ones who fought in the wars and, and died in the wars. And, um, you know, the, it, it's all really um, a, a great shame and a great, um, a, a big, I wore my love beads today that I actually made during the Vietnam War. I <laughs> <laughs> March. the president too, and it also starts there in his war room. Eisenhower you know, had it all charted and started, I'm sure, with a lot of the French information, but we don't know what's there. We did have them on the ropes though. We bombed them, and we they were ready to quit on us on a couple of occasions, and we let 
we let them off, let them get off the ropes. The next day, the sun came up again. There was new light. There was a new wave of Vietnamese and, and Vietnamese. I know that from a book hit written by Hal Moore. You've probably seen the movie We Were Soldiers. Well, Hollywood did their version of that. But the book was written by Hal Moore, the part that Mel Gibson paid. And the book was called We Were Soldiers Then and Young. And that's firsthand, not only by the colonel, but by the war correspondent, the person, the photographer who was there also, who was there trying to actually give a, an objective perspective that was his whole goal. So I refer you to that as some backing for what I say. It was interesting because I heard Hal Moore was in town a few years ago in Chicago, and he talked about sitting down with the general who he fought against there that day. And they were sitting there talking about and that's how we now know that they were close to being quit. They were ready to quit on us. We had bombed Hanoi. Later, there was another time that they were ready to quit on us. And then they were asked, Hal Moore asked, what about the 1,200? That's what I heard of as of a few years ago, missing MIAs. And the general said, well, we acknowledge there are some missing people. We haven't found them, or we'd turn over their remains. And he asked them in return, he says, what about the 300,000 remains of the Vietnamese that we haven't found, of our own people? To give you some idea of the numbers. Though. Interesting story. <coughs> Bob, I think you missed some questions. You missed some questions, though. In this, uh, I think your research needs a lot more depth than what you've already gone through. And some of the questions that you asked, you, the answers just didn't seem to fit the questions. You, you've learned some. You've read some books. But I think you're also full of a lot of deni denial. And it sounded like it was just material that's not fit to publish. So we're going to deny it, not say it. We're going to give you another version, make it publishable. Te very tempered answers in some cases. <laughs> About the volunteers, um, yeah, there were those who volunteered. There's there those who were going to be drafted and decided, well, I'm going to save my ass. I'm going to volunteer. And there's a large, large percentage who then volunteered and signed up. And then there were others who were drafted first. And then they said, wait a minute, I think I'd rather do this other opportunity. And then they went in and they signed up for either specific training for a specific job, or a job that kept them out of the fire, or maybe a promised position like Germany or something like that. So there were a lot of ways that people were influenced <coughs> that weren't counted in your numbers. I think that number's way off. And then there was the GI Bill, which we helped cover. So there were a lot of people influenced by the actual economic aspects of that. Uh, with respect to our, uh, I believe you were a Marine, or you were in the Navy? I was in the Navy. And you mentioned the Marines. Uh, I'm sure at least two-thirds of the men were U.S. Army who uh, died over there in the KIAs. Okay. But that's just indicative of the oh, percentage of the numbers of Army people. Time's up. Well, there's a lot more to say. I'd like to read to you, this oh, came from right. Op Ed News, mm -hmm. it was uh, by John Grant, who was a Vietnam veteran, and the uh, title, this was June 22nd, 2012, The Vietnam War and the Struggle for Truth. The, Vietnam, the Vietnamese won the Vietnam War by forcing the United States to abandon its intention to military sustain an artificially divided Vietnam. The history is clear. It was the United States, not the Vietnamese, who scorched the unfying elections agreed on for the 1956 in the Geneva negotiations following the French route at Dan Van Pau. Why did the U.S. undermine these elections? Yeah. As Dwight Eisenhower said in his memoir, because everyone knew Ho Chi Minh was going to win in a landslide of the order of 80% of the population of Vietnam. Hmm. So much for democracy. 
We can lose longer than you can win, was how Ho described the Vietnamese strategy be, uh, uh, against the Americans. Later in the 1980s, a Vietnamese diplomat put it this way, Robert McNamara, we knew you would leave because you could leave. We lived here. We couldn't leave. The Vietnam, Vietnam War was finally over in 75 when the North prevailed over the U.S. proxy formulation known as South Vietnam, which then dis disappeared as a nation as many thousands of our betrayed Vietnamese allies fled in small boats or were subjected to unpleasant internment camps and frontier development projects deep in the hostile jungles. In a word, the <coughs> Vietnam War was a debacle for everyone involved. Now we learn the United States government is planning a 13-year propaganda project to clean up the image of the Vietnam War in the minds of Americans. It is called the Vietnam War Commemorium Project. President Obama officially launched the project on Memorial Day with a speech at the Vietnam Wall in Washington. The project was established by Section 598 of the 604-page National Defense Authorization Act for Physical Year 2008. It budgets $5 million a year. Some have called this war air a scare on our country. Obama told the security invited Vietnam veteran crowd at the wall. But here's what I say. As any wound heals, the tissue around it becomes tougher become stronger than before. And in this sense, finally, we might begin to see the true legacy of Vietnam. Because of Vietnam and of our veterans, we now use American power smarter. We honor our military more. We take care of our veterans better because of the hard lessons of Vietnam. Because of you, America is even stronger than before. Veteran Vietnam toughened us up made us better human beings. It would, I would submit the president is wrong on that score, that, they, that there are profound lessons we have failed to learn. Phase one of the Commemorium Project goes through 2014 and will focus on recruiting support and participation nationwide. And there will inevitably be international, national, regional, state, and local events planned but a focus will be on the hometown level where the personal recognitions and thanks are most impactful. The largest is to obtain 10,000 commemorative partners. Phase two through 2017 will encourage these partners to commit to two events a year. The DOD Commemorum Office will develop and host a master calendar to let all the events reflecting tens of thousands of events across the nation as we thank and honor our veteran uh, Vietnam veterans. Phase three, I'm not reading everything, I'm just reading parts of this. Phase three from 2017 to 2025 will focus on supplement of the positive legacy established in phase one and two. The problem is that understanding is the last thing the Pentagon and the U.S. government want the American people to wrestle with. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm two more seconds. If you, yeah, just if everybody else did, if President Obama's launching language, this is your answer, I can't think of this answer. If President Obama's launching language is any indication the purpose of the Vietnam War Commemorum is to create a malleable, and supportive populace for future military operations, especially under the new doctrine of focused killing with drones and special op units now being established around the world. Yep. Thank you. All right, let's thank Bob again. He's going to say there's a lot of schedules here. Uh, you want to come up, Bob? Yeah, yeah. I, I, don't, I just wanted to say I don't have any military heroes in the background in my family. My grandfather came from Lithuania so that his sons wouldn't fight for the Tsar. Uh, <laughs> my brother, he got here to the States. I'm visiting my brother two weeks in Canada. We still won't fight for anybody. I don't see it. You don't do it yourself. Don't <laughs> okay. fight you stupid wars. Uh, I'll try to get a couple of these statistics real quick. I found my my Agent Orange reference, and uh, Agent Orange was sprayed at a rate of, of three gallons per acre 
That's nine thousandths of an ounce per square foot. And when sprayed on dense jungle foliage, less than six percent ever reached the ground. Ground troops typically did not enter a sprayed area until four to six weeks after being sprayed. And most Agent Orange contained 0 0.0002 of 1% of dioxin. And scientific research has shown that dioxin degrades in sunlight after 48 to 72 hours. So therefore, the troops' exposure to dioxin was, was infinitesimal. Um, and I want to... Uh, 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 Rhonda, there's a, a book that was published in 1998 called War in the Mind, and uh, I read a review on it on the, on the Atlantic Magazine website, and uh, I read a couple other, part, uh, other re website references, but I, I believe the figure was something like 20% of World War II veterans had PTSD, and like 18% of Vietnam vets, and uh, now the, the amount for Iraq veterans is, is much higher. It's like one out of six is, is quite a bit higher. But although I, I didn't, uh, I didn't really study anything too much about Iraq. I, I was just concentrating on, on Vietnam and stuff. And somebody said that our soldiers, we were killing poor people and stuff, and that we weren't taking uh, crooks and things like that. Well, that is wrong. We were taking crooks. There was a what happened. Uh, Towards the later part of the war, this is why the morale was so bad towards the end of the war, is because judges started giving defendants a choice between going to the army or going to jail, and a lot of them took the army. So there's where your atrocities come from. Those are the guys who did the fragging. Those are the guys who did the torture stuff. We're putting sociopaths. Bob, Bob they did that before the Vietnam War. Well, they may have, but I mean, but it came. It became a big thing towards the end of the Vietnam War, and. Uh, so that's where like fragging came from was those guys who were doing that, but not the uh, not the guys that were in there, not the early guys that were in there. Uh, they were pretty much good uh, good straight Americans. It was the guys that, you know later on uh, that were the bad apples. And that's that's where they came from. This, this choice between going to jail or going to, going to Vietnam. Well, for the most part, yeah. Um, can't think of anything other uh, real important to address other than that. Other, but if you want to uh, engage us on the uh, on the internet, uh, if you go over to the College of Complexes website. I believe there's a link to our Yahoo yeah. group, and we can have a continue the discussion online. All right, thanks, Bob. God, don't you just love the smell of napalm in the morning? No, no, no. Good idea. I was there always in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah.